Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, another uh, exciting um, jam-packed day ahead of us. Um, obviously, we're going to be focusing this morning on the theme of transport, and then this afternoon we're going to move on to food, farming and land use. Um, but we're going to get straight into our first panel of the day. So we're going to hear from five speakers on the topic of transport in two parts. Um, and the first of those um, uh, I'm going to introduce in a minute. Just before we move on to that panel, just a couple of things to remind you. I know Sarah's already uh, referenced the conversation guidelines um, and your facilitators will be sharing um, those with you this morning when you move into your small groups. Um, obviously you're working in new groups today. So when you move for the first time into your small groups, we will spend a little bit of time just connecting you with and saying hello to everyone else in your new groups. Um, so we'll make sure that that happens. Um, we've got an hour for lunch again today. So that's 12.45 until 1.45. And we will take a very short comfort break midway through the morning. Um, we will have Nigel with us today, providing wellbeing support. If you can give us a wave, Nigel, I hope you're there. Um, and uh, yeah, just to remind you that all the presentations from Thursday now and yesterday <laughs> are up on Basecamp. And the actual slides themselves, um, they will be coming um, um, on Monday or Tuesday next week as soon as we receive them from people because we don't have all of those, but all the presentations are there. Um, just to remind people, there is no, um, don't feel any pressure to be going on base camp and to be revisiting everything. You don't need to do that. If you do want to do that, by all means do that. If you want to do your own research and your own homework, fantastic, but please don't feel like you need to. Um, I just wanted to let people know that. Okay, Max, are we ready to kind of move into our first presentation? So we're going to hear first an overview from Ben Boswell from Herefordshire Council around transport emissions in Herefordshire. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Boswell and I'm here this morning to give you a short overview of the carbon emissions from the transport sector in Herefordshire. Um, if we start by looking at the total amount of transport emissions as a percentage of our all of all of our emissions. Um, what you'll see is that transport is a really large sector, counting 28% of our total emissions. And quite staggeringly, of that, 20% of our total emissions comes from road transport. So if we look at road transport and sort of go into a bit more detail, um, what you can see from this graph is looking at the vehicle types and also journey purpose. So what really stands out from this graph is that car use is the predominant mode of uh, travel with most of the emissions coming from there. And also if you look at journey purpose, it's predominantly the business transport that is where emissions are coming from. Um, also, it's really, really key to recognize that Herefordshire has a very high uh, car ownership with a high reliance on the motor vehicle because of the rural nature of the county. Um, again, if we look at those trips and try to look at how much carbon comes from the length of each trip. Uh, again, what is really, really staggering is, well, fairly understandably, that most of our carbon emissions come from the larger trips. But, but that said, it is important to note that there are an awful lot of small trips that have the opportunity to be done by sustainable transport modes. Uh, again, this pie chart, I won't go into too much detail, but what it does do is it sort of shows you the trip origins, so what the percentage is coming from trips out of the county, trips going into the county or across or within. So I thought I'd give you that one for a bit of reference. Um, again, this one's a bit too much detail. I thought it would be useful for you to, to digest separately. But what I wanted to highlight really was that within the city, 56% of trips are done by a car, 6% by bike, 13 by bus and 17 by, by foot, by walking. Um, and if you sort of look more countywide, you'll see that that rises. So 66% of all trips are done by car. A further six with people in the car as a passenger. Uh, bike use drops to 4%. Uh, staggeringly, bus drops to 2%. But walking still maintains at 16%. So still a lot of people walking uh, all over the county. Um, and really just, I suppose, one more slide with a few more facts and figures. Um, one thing that's really important to, to, to consider is that people have a lot of different factors as to how they choose how they travel. So that's very much the distance they're going to go, what the cost of, of the traveling is, safety. Uh, a lot of people travel by walking and cycling for health concerns or, or to try and get fitter. Um, 
But importantly, it's also key to recognise the need to change, uh, the need to travel. And so where we've got better broadband, it's about saying, actually, do I need to travel at all? Um, I've also included a few facts and figures there around how people commute to work and how they commute to, to school. Again, what you'll see is high numbers of, of car, really. So a real area for us to, to try and get people to either travel in sustainable vehicles, uh, alternative fuel vehicles, or to move to sustainable active travel methods. Um, and again, just to finish, Herefordshire does have some really good examples um, of active travel uh, initiatives. So we've got the on-street bike hire scheme, uh, free bus travel in the weekend, uh, and you'll hear more about that from the other presentations. So I hope that's helpful and um, enjoy the rest of the sessions. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, just as we did yesterday, we, after each of these presentations, we're going to take a, just a short period of uh, time for a bit of reflection to capture any notes down or key points from each presentation. So we'll start that now. Okay, so we're now going to hear from two speakers uh, focusing on, on how we can reduce emissions from transport. The first of these is Professor Stephen Joseph, who's a visiting professor from the University of Hertfordshire. Hello, and thank you to the Herefordshire Climate Assembly for inviting me to talk um, to your transport session. I'm Stephen Joseph, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Hertfordshire. A brief word about the university, um, it, is, uh, it has its own bus company, who know a long-standing travel plan. It does a lot of teaching and research, including a new transport masters, and it does consultancy and runs workshops and seminars. And the Smart Mobility Unit is linked increasingly to other work at the University on Climate Change and on land use planning. I'm a visiting professor there. I'm a transport policy consultant as well, and I advise transport for new homes, which I'll we'll talk about in a minute. And I was previously uh, chief executive of the Campaign for Better Transport, though I should say I'm no expert on Herefordshire. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the work that the university has been doing on the future of mobility for counties, which started because actually a lot of transport research and policy focuses on cities, but actually places like Herefordshire and Hertfordshire for that matter need attention because they often have um, high car ownership, severe traffic congestion, they have small cities, towns and villages, they have poor public transport but lots of planned house building and we ran some round tables to develop a policy agenda for those places. Now Herefordshire, I probably don't need to tell you this, and has a lot of transport problems, congestion, Alternatives to car travel are seen as poor and non-existent for many journeys. Cycling is seen as dangerous. Buses have been cut back and fares increase. And many places people want to get to have been planned around cars and roads. And all that creates car dependence, where car use is a necessity, not a choice. And car dependency adds to climate change, but it also creates other problems. Air pollution from vehicles, um, which research shows um, the impacts are wider and worse than previously thought. Health impacts, noise road traffic dominating landscapes and public places, um, road casualties, and social exclusion, because those without cars are locked out of society and with loneliness and isolation on the rise. Now, transport is already changing. There's a big move to electric vehicles, as people will know, a ban on uh, new petrol and diesel cars and vans due to come in for 2030, and similar bans later for diesel trucks and buses and for petrol motorcyclists cycles too, but the evidence suggests this won't be enough to meet the uh, net zero target of 2050 and intermediate targets of 2030s. So there's need to change travel behaviour and there's a consensus on the need to cut traffic too. And the government in Scotland has set a target to cut traffic by 20% by 2030 and there are similar targets in Wales as well. Now there is other transport technology on the horizon like driverless cars, hyperloops etc but I'm not going to talk about those, then there's quite a lot of hype around them. So what came out of the round tables we ran? Well, I think there are a number of directions of travel. Firstly, spatial planning, where new homes are built and their layout and design. Uh, short journeys, um, where some car journeys could transfer to active travel modes with the right conditions. Um, the role of e-bikes as an alternative for longer car trips. Um, and we concluded from the round tables that better public or shared transport is possible even in rural areas. Um, about the spatial planning, I've mentioned transport for new homes and this is a project that's done a number of reports, a new one is due out shortly, uh, looking at the transport impacts of new homes, looking at 20 urban extensions, 
and then also uh, planned garden towns and villages. And there are various themes emerge from that. Um, the problem is of um, car-based living. Um, traffic created by building housing in the wrong place, what we call cow pat developments, plopped in the middle of the countryside. And people relied on their cars for the great majority of journeys in the urban extensions looked at. Um, and uh, there's also parking and road access taking up so much room that there wasn't enough space for trees and gardens. Um, destinations were often car based too. And there are also issues in some cases of places without pavements. Um, and uh, lovely master plans, but reality of new roads and car parking. Um, we did find better practice. Poundbury, where 32% of residents walk to work. Dermanthorpe in York. Uh, uh, Kent, fast track around Evesfleet. Uh, uh, Leighton Buzzard and Kidbrook in South East London. And Shawfair in the Scottish borders, where a new station has been built with new development around it. Now, the implications for new housing is that if you have lots of car-based homes, it will make congestion and pollution a lot worse. Um, and so high quality public transport needs to be at the centre of development. The design of developments and surrounding roads should prioritise walking and cycling and access to public transport. The density developments, the levels of design of car parking uh, will be important and there need to be local services and facilities that people can walk and cycle to. Um, I mentioned that public transport um, can be improved um, and we um, particularly focused on Cornwall which like Herefordshire is a rural unitary county um, and that's implementing integrated timetables, good interchanges, single ticketing system and reduced fares. Uh, we also looked at the joining up of transport contracts for different public services with mainstream transport um, so as to create a more integrated system. We looked at demand responsive services, flexible bus services, shared mobility on car plans, bike hire, and scooter hire, and bringing them together, the idea of mobility hubs, of places where you can get a lot of these services together, and of mobility as a service, transport hubs. Even the Highlands of Scotland now has such an app that provides integrated uh, information and, and booking systems. I mentioned Cornwall, that has an integrated public transport system or is working towards it with a single brand, the integration of timetables between rail and bus, um, unified information systems, um, and integration of payment systems and the integration of fare systems um, in, uh, with uh, ferries and other modes coming in the future. They've integrated their public transport with these showcase corridors um, so, and you can see from this diagram that um, they've got um, a note of the population, housing targets and travel to work trips in each of the places uh, along their showcase uh, rail and bus corridors. I mentioned short distance car trips and I've mentioned that in many car trips, even in rural counties like Herefordshire are short and the walking and cycling can replace these. Um, some of these, but they do need networks that give priority to pedestrians and cyclists. I've put a link to a place in Lincolnshire with small villages, called, a place called the Deepings, which created a green walk, a network of safe walking routes around the villages linked to new housing and mandated through its neighbourhood plan. I've mentioned e-bikes and even in small places like um, uh, the, uh, the Pennines, you can find e-cargo bikes um, used for deliveries. Um, tackling journeys to work is important and uh, there are options. Uh, this is a mobility ways project um, uh, which um, works with employers to move to net zero commuting with car sharing, bespoke bus services, exist, uh, adjusting existing buses, rewards for sustainable travel and pull bikes. Um, and that looks like a, a good way of moving um, quickly on uh, less carbon-based transport. Um, I've listed some possible actions by businesses to reduce um, their um, uh, car dependency and, or, or, and target reduced single occupancy car commuting, which even in rural areas uh, appears to be possible. Um, I've mentioned, uh, you might wonder about financing funding. This might not be something that would appeal um, to Herefordshire but Nottingham has a levy on workplace parking spaces paid by employers with 10 
in these spaces. Um, it raises £300 per space per year, raises about £9 million a year for transport, uh, including uh, uh, trams and electric buses system. And, uh, it, and before the, of the pandemic, anyway, um, a very high proportion of trips were, in the city were made by public transport. People might say, well, surely people are wedged to their cars. And I think it's worth just listing the ways that travel behaviour can change. And the government uh, previously ran a local sustainable transport fund, um, which um, showed that the results of which showed that it was possible to change travel behaviour. Um, and there are other examples of that too. So moving away from car dependence is a real challenge, but it is possible to move towards less car-based development, better public transport, making cycling a real option, making walking safe and pleasant, and using new technology to make transport work. And I would conclude by suggesting that transport in places like Oakshire can be better and greener. And I'd be happy to take questions about this presentation. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, we're now going to move to a period of just 30 seconds of reflection. OK, so our final uh, speaker for this part of the panel this morning is uh, John Whiteleg, who is visiting professor for the School of Built Environment at Liverpool John Moore University, who's specifically going to present on sustainable transport in a rural area. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to make this very short presentation on transport and the importance of transport in how we go about with the overall task of getting carbon down as near as possible to zero. Uh, so very happy, and I go through it rather quickly, but there'll be lots of time to pick up issues later. Next. Um, the first point I want to make really is that, um, that there are very important links between a discussion that might appear to be a little bit uh, 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 nerdy about how we reduce transport carbon, but there are very important links with much wider benefits. Um, in order to reduce transport carbon, we have to massively improve public transport. That helps all age groups, all income groups. It helps us all to access jobs, education, and also hospitals and GPs and other NHS facilities. And the fact that we're reducing car trips is, and there's a huge amount of evidence for this, uh, it actually promotes health. Uh, the more that we walk and cycle and use the bus, the more that we actually help to reduce key major public health objectives. We reduce obesity, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And that's all well documented in publication of the World Health Organization. And also importantly, in, in the context of Herefordshire, improving alternatives to the car supports the retention of young people in villages and market towns and helps to create lively, thriving communities that are not drowning in a, in a, in a, in a car-based soup. Next slide, please. Um, I want now to refer very quickly, and, and I apologise, it, it might be a little bit too quick. Uh, there is an international and a national, it's agreed in Britain as well, um, concept, format, way of dealing with this. If we do want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, climate change damaging emissions from transport, there are three things we have to do, and in a certain order. Uh, we have to do things that are called avoid, do things that are called shift, and do things that are called improve. And this is well acknowledged around the world as the way, and in Britain, as the way to go about doing things. And we can't reduce carbon emissions in transport unless we do all three, and unless we do it in kind of priority order. So we do avoid first, and then we do shift, and then we do improve. And in the next slide, I talk a little bit about, uh, uh, more about avoid, shift, improve. Next, please. Avoid. There are lots of different ways of getting into avoid, but for the purposes of Herefordshire, and it's a general point about rural England anyway, we must try and avoid building lots of new homes on greenfield sites that haven't seen a bus since 1934 and where there are no adequate walking and cycling facilities. Uh, we must avoid building new homes that build in, literally build in, car dependency. And there's a huge amount of information about how we can do this. It isn't an argument against building new homes. It's about making the whole location design of new homes compliant with the way we expect people to travel in the future and the way we expect that to contribute to zero carbon. Next, please. Uh, for, for more information and no time to talk about it in detail now, 
all these suggestions about uh, avoid and shift and improve are included in this report. It's a South Shropshire uh, report. It borders, of course, on Herefordshire. And in this report, we set out in great detail how we should, how we must develop high quality walking, cycling, public transport options, and with the willing cooperation, there's no compulsion in this, encourage people to reduce cars, to use cars less and use the alternatives more. So please have a look at the Climate Action Plan. Next, please. The conclusion of the South Shropshire Climate Action Plan is boiled down to 15 points that we call our asks. This is what we're asking for. Now, in the time available today, I'm certainly not going to try and take us through 15 things, but I wanted to pick out these five things. Uh, so basically, in, in transport and reducing transport carbon, it's very important to have clear, practical, funded interventions in place. And I just wanted to list five of those without going into too much detail uh, this morning. So for example, we could build cycle paths, totally car free, totally traffic free, connecting all schools and colleges with their main catchment areas. We could massively expand car share clubs. And I've been very impressed with what I've seen is already going on in Leominster. We could follow the CPRE, the Council for the Protection of Rural England uh, report, which specifies a funded plan for giving every village one bus every hour. And, th and that is evidence based in terms of how it will actually attract car trips, uh, not all car trips, of course, but a substantial number of car trips onto buses. We can follow the Cornwall County Council example of having one ticket that covers all buses and all local rail and fully integrated bus and rail timetables because at the moment and it's not just a Herefordshire problem it's a general problem our, our buses and our trains and our ticketing system actually deter people from using public transport and we can and we must adopt enforced 20 mile per hour speed limits on all streets and roads and villages because if we have 20 mile per hour more people come out and walk and cycle for example we encourage our children to walk and cycle to local schools next slide please Improve can be a bit tricky uh, in the sense that in, in Britain, certainly, but not in other countries, in Britain, improve tends to mean electric vehicles. Now, this is sometimes a controversial subject, but electric vehicles are certainly an important part of how we go about decarbonizing transport. But the important thing which tends to be missed in Britain is it's not instead of. We need all the major upgrades possible to walking, cycling and public transport. And the view amongst transport specialists and people that work on electric vehicles is that even if we did get 100% electric vehicles, it's not enough. We need to we need all the improvements in walking and cycling and buses. And we need to make the whole approach to transport spending and budgets much more socially inclusive. How do we help people on low income? How do we help students? How do we help people to get to jobs and to commute? How do we help people to get to hospitals? And electric vehicles will continue for a long, 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 long time out of the range of our of our ability to pay. Next, please. I do want to say a word about the potential for individuals, households, families, behave, behavioural change. Uh, it can again be a little bit techy, but the basic point is very simple. When we talk uh, supportively to large groups of people about, please will you consider using your car less, please will you walk and cycle more, please will you use buses more, there's a huge amount of support for those alternatives. But it all boils down to the need for high quality information, uh, pricing incentives, uh, bus fares in England are far too expensive, and also involves a lot of consistency with planning. We need to plan healthcare and plan housing. And there is something with a most unpleasant acronym, if you like, there is a, there's a whole system of doing this called mobility as a service, the biggest transport revolution of the 21st century. This is described in full in the South Shropshire report, and this is a vital ingredient, I suggest, for any plan to decarbonise transport in Herefordshire. Next, please. The good news is we're nearly finished. Um, it is important in transport and carbon and in the Herefordshire discussion about how we go about doing these things to, ha to have very large expectations and very significant, bold ideas in mind. So I just wanted to present two photos really about examples. There are many more 
for example, this is a tiny, tiny bit of the full picture. So, for example, in southern Germany, in a place called Munstertal, 5,000 residents, uh, what you see in this, in this photo is something that almost never exists anywhere in England. A bus and a train meet. They're approximately five steps from each other. They're on the level. They're coordinated, they're, they're family friendly, child friendly, school student friendly, and we can have fully, we talk about integrated public transport, but this is the reality. We can have high quality, joined up thinking, integrated buses and trains that are affordable, and we must have that in Herefordshire. Next, please. And similarly, uh, we need to think more, more deeply and more widely about the nature of streets and the functions of streets and the ability of places to, to foster walking and cycling and be attractive to, to, to everybody, to incomers, to businesses, to the elderly, to the disabled. And again, I, I, this is a comparison between a very good place, Stauffen in southern Germany, approximately 8,000 people, and Ledbury in Herefordshire, approximately 9,000 people. And the difference between these two places is astonishing and staggering, but the, because Ledbury, a very, very attractive town, by the way, is actually drowning in unpleasant traffic. And it is possible to create a, a, a very, very strong local economy, strong public health and low traffic conditions. And that's the direction I'm suggesting we should go in. And finally, next slide, please. Um, I'm very pleased with Greta Thunberg in Sweden, uh, and this is basically the point about we must do these things now we don't want a discussion about 2050 we don't want a discussion about 2040 i can put up with the 2030 but i'd like it sooner than that thank you all very much for listening thank you john for that okay we're just going to have a short period of reflection just capture down any notes particularly any questions you've got for our three speakers thank you Okay, so we're now going to move you into your small groups. They're obviously new small groups for you uh, today. So we have built in a little bit of time for you to introduce yourself to each other at the start of those. And you'll be coming up with your questions for Ben, Stephen and John. Okay, we'll see you back in 20 minutes. <clears throat> okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you found that a, a useful session. So we are now joined by the three speakers that you've heard from this morning. So that's Stephen Joseph, John Whiteleg and Ben Boswell. Um, so we're going to do the same as we did yesterday, go around each of your group facilitators, so we'll give your main question. And then if we have any time at the end, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so Lauren, would you like to kick off, please, with the question from your group? Yes, just for my group, we've got lots of questions, so we'll get them answered later on, but we're going to go for if as a county we're aiming for the integrated transport, can you tell us perhaps, Ben, what is already in place, you know, what strategy is there to get started on this, and uh, is there a priority to get those things going, what, what will come first, what will come second, etc. Thank, uh, thank you, should I, should I jump straight into that one? Yes, please, Ben, yeah. Okay. Um, as you're probably aware, but there was um, some big decisions on transport last year. And so at the moment, there's a big review of the Herefordshire transport strategy. Um, and I think there's about £140 million pounds of capital allocated at the moment. And that's looking at a big review of the active travel network, uh, bus services, uh, sort of demand <coughs> management of parking, trying to get the behaviours <coughs> through to car use, and also looking at the Eastern Link Road. Um, there's also a bid in at the moment for a bus service improvement plan, and we're also developing uh, a sort of local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, which is really looking at how we can, uh, well, all, all the opportunities through mapping destinations for uh, walking, cycling to, to improve improve active travel modes, really, and, and all the infrastructure there. So that's a bit of a flavour, I hope, but there is a lot of work going on transport at the moment. Uh, I had sort of three minutes to introduce, so I it was hard to know what to include really, but um, if, if of interest, I can put some links to uh, reports and uh, commitments on what's coming forward as well, if, that, if that'd be helpful. In the base cut, that'd be great. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. John, I just wondered if you had anything you wanted to add to that, you know, just from a kind of external perspective in terms of the approach that Herefordshire should be taking. Yeah, I, I think Hereford has already demonstrated a great deal of um, initiative and enthusiasm for going in the right direction. 
I think, as always, and, and I am impressed with her for sure, but as always, there's a lot of scope for doing more. And, and I think the, the emphasis has to be to really get, get into detail in the upgrade of uh, this dreaded word, integration, integrated public transport. All trains, all buses must talk to each other, coordinate, one ticketing, uh, timetables coordinated, and, and also adopting the, the German and, and the Austrian and the Swedish system. Uh, when you're in Sweden, where I've lived in a very rural, much more rural than Herefordshire in Sweden, I, I have one card, it covers all buses, all local trains, and every journey is capped at about three pounds per journey. That's any distance, right, in, in an area that's about a hundred mile radius. And that covers any number. It's limited to 75 minutes. So you have to, you can go backwards and forwards and round in circles, do whatever you want. Um, but basically it means we need to get a lot smarter with our ticketing and our options and our pricing. And, and that, that I think is the main thing uh, rapidly followed by some other initiatives that are being taken around Europe and not so much in England, which is really getting stuck into high quality cycle paths so that cyclists can actually, I mean, the, the English system, and I, I try not to be unkind, is about as bad as rubbishy as you could imagine if you set out to make it bad and rubbishy, which is a painted, painted bit of blue line on a bit of road with a 44 ton truck uh, sharing the space with you. Now, it couldn't be worse than that, uh, but we need proper segregated cycle paths connecting every school and every college with its main catchment areas. No ifs, no buts, no messing. So there's lots of scope. And by the way, for another day, perhaps, there's lots of ways of raising the cash to do that. Mm. OK, thank you for that, John. Um, can we move to your group, please, Vicky, for your main question? Questions all for Ben, I'm afraid, but everyone did say how good all the presentations were. So the questions for Ben were, very, were more or less what you said before, but specifically, School buses, which um, would should be uh, much better because an awful lot of congestion around school bus times. Rotherwas similar buses and trams to um, Rotherwas, and what about railway stations reopening such as Pontrilas? So, those are the, were the specific things raised. Thank you, Vicky. Okay, so I say there's, a, there's quite a lot in there. Um, yeah, I know, and you know, that, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so as I said, the, the main piece of work really is reviewing the transport strategy, which is overarching, looking at all, all of the travel across the county. Uh, within that, we're also going to be doing a school travel strategy review this year as well. So that would pick up a lot of the school travel within that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work going on with uh, buses at the moment. I mean, I think you're probably aware that I think one of the providers pulled out recently. So the, the team are doing a lot of work on, on public transport. Uh, and again, as I said, there's a there's a bus improvement plan at the moment, which we're looking at, which I think was it's just under, I think it was 18 million pound bid to government to improve bus services. So hopefully that gives you a flavor that there is strong commitment to, to look at all of those. Um, again, I don't know if I could, I haven't really got all the detail to hand to take you through it, but I could provide stuff again for reference. Okay, that would be great. Thanks, ben. Thank you. Um, Stephen, was there anything in particular around school buses that came up from in, in your research? Um, I think um, it, it isn't uh, just school buses. I, well, actually, one of the things about it is there is a risk of, um, I, I mentioned, I think, total transport, and there is a risk of having lots of individual contracts for, by individual public services, um, uh, you know, that you have uh, non-emergency patient transporters, one set of vehicles running around the place, and uh, school buses is another set of vehicles running around the place, and um, the, it's, it's quite, it, it's, it's deceptively attractive to have those things because they're very targeted. Um, but um, actually, it's better, to, if you can, to try and uh, mainstream all of that and to do them together. Uh, the, there was an experiment a few years ago, as I say, called Total Transport. I can't remember whether Herefordshire did any of that. Um, but... Um, it, it, you know, the, the, there is a, a, a you know, you, it being provocative, I could say there's actually lots of rural transport in places like Herefordshire. It's just that it's being run in little silos and that actually integrating that, you might actually get more public transport for less, uh, for, for less cash. Um, I, I, I see the comment in the chat. Yeah, I, I think school buses are a very good idea. And actually, one of the tricks, I think, is not to ha just have a school bus contract, is to have buses that do school journeys and then do other journeys 
um, that do, say, social services transport during the day and, and things, so that you actually make the most of the, uh, of the vehicles you've got. Um, and that involves um, some uh, sophisticated pooling of budgets, which uh, sometimes public services aren't very good at. Um, but I, I think it, uh, I, it, one of the sort of starting points I'd suggest for Herefordshire would be to look at all the contracts run by not just the council, but by the health authority, health trusts and so on, um, and by other public bodies and see whether there's an opportunity to pull them. Um, so I, I think also, um, you know, that it shouldn't be underestimated the extent to which if you can make walking and cycling more attractive for some school journeys, and I accept that in places like Herefordshire, some of the school journeys will be quite long, um, that you, know, you can get a lot of people cycling. And um, John uh, always likes to quote um, uh, uh, you know, European examples, and I always quite like to quote uh, uh, English examples, just because sometimes um, uh, you know, it's easier to go, um, uh, oh, well, that's Europe, we, uh, we're completely different from them. And um, I, I mean, I did come across a school in Ipswich, which isn't very different from some of the areas around Hereford, I think. And some, they've managed just by putting in some decent cycle paths and so on to get something like a 700 of the thousand pupils cycling to school. Um, so it can be done. Okay. Um, That's great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, Mary, can we move to your group now, please, for your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this, is a, uh, this is for Ben. Um, do planning regulations for new housing developments consider or insist on sustainable travel options of walking, cycling and buses? Many are in rural areas and are car reliant. Yeah, um, so yes, I mean, uh, transport is a statutory quantity of, of planning, so uh, highways colleagues would look at all of the new developments coming through and there are policies in in the local plan for that. Um, as I said yesterday, really, the local plan is under review at the moment uh, to look how we can improve that. Um, but yes, it, it is included. Um, and I think what we do, I mean, what I meant to say on the last one, really, we're talking about schools and schools and new developments <coughs> and businesses. It's also around encouraging the development of travel plans. So for a new development to, to get a travel plan, they're looking at what the, you know, what, what's possible, what, what facilities can be put in, uh, and just going back to the last one, it's really key with schools as well, because it's around that behaviour, understanding trip origins, the needs, what, what is possible. So um, that's a very key part of it as well. OK, thanks very much, Ben. Uh, Stephen, were you going to say something then? Yes, I was. Um, but you may have noticed my presentation had quite a bit about this. I, I think um, one of the problems is there's quite a lot of kind of custom and practice in the way in which um, transport to new housing developments done. There are all sorts of old style transport models that are, are tend to be used that kind of assume that everybody's going to drive everywhere unless otherwise stated. And that makes it, it uh, uh, that means that you have these great master plans for new housing developments with lots of walking and cycling and you end up with big roads and car parks. Um, because, you know, um, in, in the words of one uh, person I've, uh, uh, who, who's looked at this, the computer says roads. Um, and um, I think uh, this is something for Herefordshire Council to do, which is to review how they're approaching new housing development uh, and not, you know, and, and assuming um, that uh, if you do put in some good walking and cycling links and good bus links, people will use them rather than just assuming they won't. Um, one, um, uh, 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 there's one development uh, we know of um, near Leicester. Um, where the developer, which is the local landowner actually, um, instead of putting, doing what a lot of developers do, which is to put in a bus service that runs from 7am to 7pm, Monday to Friday, and then nothing at weekends, um, has a demand responsive bus service, um, which runs from 6am to 11pm, uh, seven days a week. Um, and, um, you know, there's good evidence, and, and it started from when the first residents moved in. Um, okay. So that kind of uh, thing, I think, is worth a look. Okay. Um, okay. That's great. Thank you, Stephen. John, I'll come to you really quickly. Okay. I'm just conscious of time and needing to yeah. get around the other two groups. Uh, uh, just a very quick point that connects a lot of these different strands. Uh, Herefordshire Council, uh, Herefordshire Council has considerable powers in planning and highways and transport terms in the in this shady area called travel plans. 
So they can, they can insist upon high quality travel plans, residential travel plans, workplace travel plans and school travel plans, which means that they can actually insist upon high quality planning strategies, measures to maximize non-car use and minimize car use and, and do, do with that on, deal with that on a very localized uh, basis. So in other words, no, no general across the board uh, 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 applies to everybody. It can all be designed at the local level. And one thing I would like Herefordshire to do is to invest in, in, in the in the residential travel plan, school travel plan, and workplace travel plan field. And that produces massive results. But it's tended to go down down the plug hole in recent years in all local authorities. Not a Herefordshire criticism, and it needs to be revived. That's great. Thank you, John. That's really useful. Uh, Paul, can we come back to, to you, please, for the question from for your group? Yeah, we, our, our group came up with a question around implementation. Uh, we loved the idea of integrating bus and rail. Sounds great. Of course, nobody would be against that. Uh, but why isn't it happening already? But 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 how do we actually get those different organisations to talk to each other? And are there any major barriers in that? Because we don't want to specify something and then not happen. No. OK, thank you. Um, Stephen, do you have any insight into that? I, I did talk a fair bit about Cornwall. Um, and the reason I put Cornwall in there is the Cornwall is exactly like Herefordshire. It's a rural unitary county council, and it has done some of this. It's done it, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, it's been a fairly uphill struggle um, to get the trains and the buses to talk to each other, um, or even the, the different buses to talk to each other, actually. Um, but they have done it. And one of the things I, I, I put in a couple of slides about what Cornwall are up to, and um, I, I, they, what they've done is to use any funding that's sort of uh, passing, you know, uh, in, in the old times, European funding, um, you know, up, um, uh, recovery funding, um, all sorts of stuff from COVID, all sorts of stuff, to um, fund hubs at railway stations for buses, uh, to uh, get the buses to, um, uh, to, to fund good bus services. I think, uh, John, you looked at uh, what Cornwall would be doing and thought it yeah. was really good. Yeah. Um, but I, the reason I, I've gone on about it is because Cornwall, I don't think, have any more powers or I mean, more or less powers than Herefordshire. So yeah. it's a really interesting model. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure, um, who, I, I think you might find it useful to talk uh, because of who runs the service, some of the services through Hereford, to talk to Transport for Wales, um, who are very keen on this kind of stuff, but obviously for um, uh, railway geography reasons, they happen to run the, uh, the borderline service. Um, so, um, uh, but they, they would be, I think, um, quite uh, happy to, uh, to, to talk about this kind of stuff. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, can we just move to, the, to Kath's group, please, uh, for the final question? <clears throat> Um, hello. Yeah, we've had covered a lot of questions um, raised in our group have been discussed already, so I'll focus on what hasn't been. Um, there was a question about the 20 mile an hour um, speed limit um, that uh, you were talking about perhaps bringing in in villages, and apparently one of the local villages um, had tried to put in a speed limit for quite some time and there's been resistance. They thought it was probably from Herefordshire Council, so we wanted to know why that resistance might be there and also why the 20 mile an hour limit um, in Hereford City itself disappeared. I think that's probably mainly to Ben. Thank you, Kay. You got any insight on, into that, Ben? Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know the detail of that specific example, but if you maybe want to bring me over some information, I can pick up with colleagues to, to look into that. I, I say I wouldn't be able to answer that now. Okay. Um, and the 20 mile an hour zones, so were you referring to the ones that came in through the emergency active travel mess, uh, during COVID, because I think as part of the early re um, response to COVID, there was a lot more temporary cycle routes, temporary 20 mile an hour zones, and they all came in on, on a temporary basis, which is why that would uh, come out. I know there's a lot of work looking at 20 mile an hour zones mm -hmm. at the moment as part of the wider city master planning as well. So um, probably something to pick up as, as well separately, if that's okay. Okay, thanks, Ben. John, I know you wanted to add yeah. to that. Just very quickly, I know time is short. Uh, I, I have a note, I won't try to get out, that Herefordshire Council Cabinet has agreed to a general wide area default 20 mile per hour speed limit, which means all residential roads, or 90% plus, because there will be exceptions. So that policy is agreed. 
and I think Herefordshire Council are actually trying to work out a way mm. of, of how that is uh, implemented, you know, because you don't do it all in one go, you know, it might be over two or three years. The evidence is it really does work very well, and it really does work in rural areas, and it really encourages alternatives to the car, like walking and cycling to schools, you know, where distances are appropriate. The interesting thing is it's strongly recommended by all public health bodies and by the World Health Organization because it also helps to deal with this, this wonderful area called physical activity, active travel. You know, if we do want to reduce obesity and cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So it really is a win-win situation. Herefordshire is currently ahead of the pack. You know, it's ahead of the general trend. By places with the word shire at the end try to resist 20 mile per hour and I've never worked out why uh, but Hereford is ahead of the general trend and is act actually on that implementation strategy plan now so they should be congratulated. Okay that's great thank you. We've got two minutes left before we go into a break. Does anybody have a, a question that they would like to ask? If not we can just break early. Ah, Paul, you've got well, another question. It's just come up in the chat. I think it would help. We got in the 20 miles an hour just to say why specifically it reduces emissions. Yeah. If, if I've got a minute, I can say that. Uh, and again, I, if anyone wants to come back to me, I, I can be even more boring than anybody else you know with lots of detail. <laughs> I mean, basically, what 20 mile per hour does is ease the, the smooth flow of traffic. It, it, this is well researched. It massively reduces bouts of acceleration and deceleration. Interestingly, road humps and bumps and things like that don't. You know, they, they don't have that effect. So if you get a smooth flow of traffic with 90% plus of the traffic going at around 20 mile per hour, then you get a really smooth flow. It, it actually increases the capacity of the road as well. And because it's reducing acceleration and deceleration incidences, it reduces emissions of all kinds, including the deadly particulate matter that actually gives kids asthma. So it really is a win-win. Okay, thank you, John. And I'm sorry, Malcolm and Don, we are now out of time because we need to just make sure that you have your, your full 10 minutes break. But please let your facilitator know your questions. We'll ensure that they are answered. No. Um, so just to say thank you very much to John, Stephen and Ben for joining us for the Q&A. Your presentations were excellent. And yeah, thank you for, for doing that. Um, so we're now going to go into a 10 minute break. So we need to return at 11.19, please. So feel free to switch your screens off and we'll see you back here at 11.19. Thanks. Thank Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so we're going to hear from two other speakers now within our theme of transport. And these are two really positive examples of uh, what are happening elsewhere. So uh, we have a, an example from West Oxfordshire and also uh, a presenter from Sweden. So um, if we can play the first uh, presentation, please, Matt, which is from Margaret Burden from West Oxfordshire Community Transport. Thank you, Max. Hello, good morning. My name is Margaret Burden from West Oxfordshire Community Transport and I'm delighted to be have been invited to speak to the Herefordshire Climate, Citizens Climate Assembly. I've been invited along to, to represent what it's like to be a community organisation that has decided to take matters into their own hand to try and provide a bus service. We are a community-owned, not-for-profit, scheduled bus service operator providing regular, reliable, punctual and efficient bus services. And we do it in an absolutely professional way. The fact that we're community-owned, the fact that we're not-for-profit, in no way detracts from the absolute top standard of professionalism we wish to deliver. And I think that's really important to bear that in mind. Next. We operate in West Oxfordshire, as the name is a big uh, clue to that. It's, it's a very rural part of Oxfordshire, in fact. We just have three towns of any size. There's Whitney, which is the largest at 28,000. Then we've got Carterton at 16 and a half, and then Chipping Norton at 7,000. But an awful lot of our landscape is taken up with a lot of small and scattered villages and hamlets. Next. So when did we start this journey? We started, as you can see, we registered with the FCA on the 30th of November in 2016. We are a what's called a prudential a cooperative society. Therefore, we register with the FCA, not with Companies House. Within two months of registering, we started our operations on the 27th of January 2017. So we've been going just under five years now. And when we started, we picked up two routes that were already existing 
two services on an hourly basis linking the outer areas of Whitney with the town centre. At that point, we, have, uh, we had an average weekly passenger journeys of about 560. So it was quite a small bit that we picked up. Next. So why did we do this? Every community operator will have a different reason and a different response. Ours was very much a response to the change of policy by Oxfordshire County Council, who decided to remove subsidies from all bus routes across the county. The result of this is that, of course, many commercial operators withdrew all their buses where it was not seen to be commercially viable, leaving thousands of people without public transport access to local services, shops, college, schools, work, on a travel and means to visit family and friends. In other words, a lot of people felt very cut off and disconnected. So where are we now? So five years on, we provide a half hourly service Monday to Friday in Whitney, together with a Saturday morning service, pre-COVID, and of course COVID's had a huge impact on our services that we deliver, our passenger numbers were roughly 900 a week on that particular service. Then just a year after we started, we then launched our rural service, where we linked five villages to Whitney, which was very much seen as the sort of commercial centre for those villages. And we started off with a Monday to Friday service, and then added on a Saturday service a couple of months before COVID came. And we generated something like 300 passenger journeys a week. It was popular, but it took a long time to build up to those numbers now. Then in March 2021, we started another service in Carterton where we linked the outer areas of the town with the centre. And we just do that currently three days a week. Passenger numbers are now 23 a day. So nine months in, we've or almost doubled the number of passengers that we have per day. And since we started, we have a, provided 180,000 plus passenger journeys. And I have to say, if we hadn't had COVID, I, that figure would probably be closer to 220, 230,000 passenger journeys in five years, which is, I think, is very significant and suggests that the demand and need for that particular services that we provide is certainly very much there. Next. So how do we operate? We're not for profit. However, as I said right at the beginning and stressed, we like to run a, a very professional operation. So we pay our drivers because we're asking them to do shifts. We've got one full-time driver and nine part-time drivers. And um, because we, we ask them to do regular shifts, it's not something that you could expect a, a volunteer drivers to do. We also have an operations manager who we pay as well. He has a qualification in transport management. So he's the one who guides us when it comes to things like legislation, regulations, all to do with running bus services. And as you can appreciate, there's a lot of legislation and guidance and regulations attached to that and appropriately so. And then in the last year, we've managed to secure funds to pay for a part-time administrator which is very helpful because we do need people to keep all our information together to be able to submit things appropriately and in time. Then we have volunteers, most of whom are board members, and we provide management, financial services, fundraising, PR and marketing. But also we do have a benefit as we are a community owned cooperative, we are members of, of Co-ops UK from whom we buy a very, cost-effective support package to advise us on HR, governance and legal aspects. Next. Right, our other resources are our physical ones. You saw right at the beginning on our slide, first slide that it's a minibus that we operate. So we have six 16-seater minibuses. The benefit of minibuses is that you don't need to have drivers with professional qualifications to drive them. They just have to have a, what's called a D1 on their ordinary driving license. That means the access to a pool of drivers is larger. The disadvantages of minibuses is that they are not, unlike buses, they're not made on a conveyor belt. Buses are converted vans. So it does mean that there are firstly, not huge numbers of them out there. And secondly, they can be prone to problems. All our buses are all rather elderly, 
and second hand because they're very expensive because of being coach built. However, the advantage is because they are small 16 seater buses, they're actually quite good to get around the little narrow lanes that we've got locally and also some of the narrow parked up roads that we have within town as well. The other asset we have, which is hugely valuable and which we struggled with before we had it and is a depot where we've got an office and a yard to park our buses. And that's been a huge benefit. And again, we've fundraised to, to be able to get hold of that. The other thing we're doing, which I think will help you think more along the lines of climate change, is we're very conscious of the need to think about how we can be more environmentally friendly and if we can move away from our diesel buses. So we've just got fundraised to have a piece of research into the financial, operational and commercial benefits of moving, moving to non-fossil fuel vehicles. This is something when we've finished it, we're very happy to share with the wider transport community. Next. Now, why do we do it? Because it's hard work, particularly those of us who volunteer, but it is something every single day our drivers say that people get on the bus and they say almost without exception, I don't know what I do without this little bus. It is an absolute lifeline for them. We also know it reduces car journeys, particularly parents of college students from the outlying villages. We also take people into work and back again. But another very, very crucial part of our services, we know that it helps to combat isolation and loneliness. And that a lot of passengers use the bus daily, not necessarily because they need to go and use it and go to the shops, but they just love being on the bus where it's a nice chatty environment and they meet people that they haven't seen for a bit and catch up on local news. So there's a lot of real reasons why we do it. It is a real, real asset to our local community and it's absolutely essential that we do it. Okay, thank you very much for that, Margaret. It's a really uh, interesting presentation. And um, we're going to hear now from John Hultain from uh, Sweden, from a, a, an organization called K2. We have 20 seconds, please, for our reflection and just to note down any uh, key thoughts or questions that you might have for Margaret later. Okay, thanks for that, everyone. Um, so, Max, can we hear now from, from the second presentation, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Jon Hultén. I am the director of K2, the Swedish Knowledge Centre for Public Transport. We are a research organization based on a collaboration between three Swedish universities and the three largest metropolitan areas in Sweden and their respective public transport agencies. Our focus is to develop public transport as a means for more sustainable cities and regions. Personally, I have a background as a researcher in political science. But I have also worked outside academia as a planner at regional agencies, as a chief strategist at the Swedish Transport Administration, and as an advisor at the Ministry of Transport at the Swedish government. In this intervention today, I will talk about the transition to a climate neutral transportation system and the role public transport can play in that uh, transition. For those of you who uh, have been to Sweden, uh, you know that it's a big country, almost twice as big as the UK, but only with 10 million uh, inhabitants. So even though most people live in cities, we also have many scarcely populated areas and uh, people living in rural areas. In Sweden, public transport is a regional responsibility. The regions decide themselves how much to spend on public transport and how to organize the traffic. And more than 90% of public transport in Sweden today is procured, which means that it's, it is controlled by the public, but operated by private companies under contract. In general, in Sweden, 50% uh, of the costs are covered by tax money and the other 50% comes from fair box revenues. The Swedish parliament has adopted a quite ambitious national target to reduce CO2 emissions from domestic transport by 70% uh, till 2030. So that's only you know, eight years away. 
Um, and in the year 2045, the transport system shall be CO2 and climate neutral. This is, of course, a major challenge. It requires a strong political commitment and many, many ambitious measures at local, regional and national levels. There is no silver bullet uh, on how to achieve this, but I will try to highlight two areas where public transport can contribute to this transition. The first area, and perhaps obvious one, is that public transport just as other modes of transportation, has to make a change from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. And we know that this can be done because in Sweden we have already done it. If we look back some 10 years, uh, back to 20, 2010, uh, less than 20% of buses in Sweden in public transport was made with renewable fuels. Today, that figure is more than 90%. In Stockholm, for example, all buses are now opera operated on renewable fuels, both in urban and rural traffic. And as you can see from this graph, different fuels have been used in this transition. Biodiesel has played a large role, illustrated by the blue parts in the graph, but in some regions, Biogas has been a very important uh, part as well. In recent years, we have seen a strong trend towards electrified buses, which beside positive climate effects also have other effects, uh, such as more energy efficiency, less noise and uh, less uh, other forms of emissions, which are important, especially in, in uh, urban areas. So how did this happen? Well, I think there are many uh, explanations. One is that there has been strong political decisions at regional level coupled with uh, technological development. Uh, climate targets has been included in procurements of public transport. Larger regions have uh, focused a lot on developing biogas, biogas schemes, biogas infrastructure and have demanded their operators to run buses on biogas. Smaller regions have tended to have more functional demands in their procurement, where the operators themselves have decided on which fuel to use, which renewable fuel to use, that is. And the easiest uh, solution for many operators have been to run buses on biodiesel, as it requires very few changes compared to uh, operate a traditional diesel bus. The second area that I want to highlight is uh, to create a more climate neutral transportation system through a modal shift from personal cars to more public transport. To create such, uh, such a shift, many different policy instruments are needed. We must combine carrots and sticks. Uh, we have to make public transport more attractive in terms of comfort, speed, and costs. Um, we have to make, at the same time, uh, traveling with private cars less attractive. So combining carrots and sticks. And as you probably know, uh, carrots are often more popular uh, than sticks, but both are needed and they need to balance each other. Carrots often come with the costs. They often require a public investment of some sort. Sticks, for example, road charging or parking levy schemes also come at a price, but they can also generate funding. So balancing these types of, of measures are really important. I would say that uh, increasing public transport ridership is more challenging in rural areas than in urban areas but it is not impossible. And I would like to share some insights that we have from how to work with public transport uh, in uh, rural areas. Well, traditional bus lines in the countryside or in, in more rural contexts often have many, many stops, uh, both within and between smaller villages. They are, tend to be quite slow and not very comfortable. Uh, in Southern Sweden, 
many regional bus lines have been changed in the past years. They have either been replaced by regional trains or by uh, regional buses. We studied 14 traditional bus lines that were replaced by local trains and compared them with 14 lines that remained unchanged. And in average, we could see that 38% an, uh, an increase in ridership compared to the lines where uh, the old bus lines were maintained. Uh, and this can be explained by shorter travel times, higher comfort and more departures. The costs for passengers were not changed uh, between these um, uh, lines. What was interesting to see was that the increase in ridership did not only occur in the villages where there were stations, but also in the surroundings. More people went to the village to catch a train, partly thanks to also investments in commuter parking places and bicycle parking at the train stops. So, so this is really interesting, but we don't know uh, for sure how this affected different groups of travelers. For example, elderly people or children with less possibilities to commute to the stations. So even though more direct lines and services attract more ridership on an aggregate level, it has to be complemented with feeder traffic that extend the range of public transport so that also people living in the countryside and with less individual mobility options uh, have a chance to utilize these new services. In, in Sweden, most regions have some kind of demand responsive traffic where you as a citizen can order a transportation. However, it is often rather expensive for the public transport authority and therefore sparsely marketed. So we believe that new types of demand responsive transport have to be tested and have to be implemented that takes people to and from their homes to the closest public transport hub or station. A good example of this is the so-called plus tour, which is uh, quite common in Denmark these days. It's a service that takes people the last mile to and from public transportation. And this is a service that is open to everyone who has ordered, uh, already ordered a public transport uh, journey. It costs, uh, in addition to the, the, the journey that you already make, it costs around two and a half euro. And of course, this is highly subsidized by the public, but it, it is one way to extend the range of the public transportation system for more people. So to summarize what I have said, um, public transport can contribute to the transition to a climate neutral uh, society in several ways. One way is through a change to renewable fuels within public transport. Another way is to implement policy instruments that increase the share of public transport at the expense of private cars. To make change happen, you need to work both with carrots and sticks. Thank you very much for listening and good luck with your important work. Bye. So thank you, John, for that presentation. Um, and both Mar Margaret and John will be with us uh, for the Q&A. So let's take our 20 seconds now, just to, uh, we're, I'm shortening it a little bit because we're a bit over time. But yeah, if we can take 20 seconds just to reflect. Okay, that's great. So you're now gonna move into your small groups to consider the questions that you would like to put to the speakers. And you have 15 minutes for that. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so we're now joined by our two speakers, Margaret Burden and John Hultain from Sweden. Um, so we have 15 minutes for this Q&A. Um, so if I can go to Vicky's group, first of all, please, for your question, Vicky. Um, right, our questions. Um, our, our main question, I think, um, was to Margaret. Um, how sustainable is the West Oxfordshire community transport scheme in terms of you make a lot of use of volunteers and like all charities that can be difficult and um, therefore where does the where does the funding come from and does that include passengers as paying for journeys yeah hi Vicky thank you for your question um, we actually as I, I said our model is that we do pay our drivers and we have a paid operations manager and a paid administrator yeah. Volunteering is more to do with sort of the, the additional background stuff, sort of things that I do. 
we our money we run scheduled services yeah so we have uh, general public who use our buses concessionary fare users from and we get reimbursement from our county council for concessionary fare users we also have fare paying passengers as well and we obviously get receipt of their fares too but you're absolutely right um fare income is not sufficient we have to look for additional income approximately 30 percent of our income per year we either fundraise donations or we look at other income streams and at the moment we're looking at the idea of using advertising on our buses internally and externally we're looking at the idea of bus hire but there are a few issues associated with that so we have to constantly be very dynamic be on the ball and um, to us it's really important that we are sustainable we couldn't have a model where if um, some key person left the whole thing sort of fell apart so it's something we're very conscious of and we're we're very keen to try and convert into, into alternative income streams rather than just through fundraising thank you thank you margaret um mary are you ready for your question from your group yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you. brilliant thank you uh, this is for you, Margaret. Um, this you mentioned the the council supporting with subsidies for the the costs of the buses. Um, did you work with them to sort of promote community transport together and provide any more integrated community transport solutions like integrated timetables? Um, and how could we do this in Herefordshire? Yeah. Hi there. Um, our support from the county council is primarily through reimbursement on concessionary fares. Uh, we did have been successful in having one grant from them to help pay for our administrator and running of our depots. Um, no, and your question about coordinating sort of community transport at a county level, unfortunately, that is not something that Oxfordshire, in fact, do. Having said that, we ourselves do talk to our fellow bus provi service providers, both community transport and also stagecoach, actually. Um, we want to ensure that what we're providing sort of provides the best opportunity for passengers. So for example, when we link into the town centre, we make sure that it's timely for Oma transport, transport, say to Oxford, for example. Um, but it is something you're right, where we should have, we, it would be good to have better coordination at county level on that. And it's something which Herefordshire might want to look at. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, Paul, do you have the question from your group, please? Yeah, uh, another one which is related to money, I think, uh, from our group, um, uh, particularly reference to Sweden. I don't know whether it's actually John who needs to answer this, but um, we consider Sweden quite a wealthy country. How would the UK actually fund this? I think there's some comments in the chat about, you know, we could stop doing this and then we'd have money for something else. Where does the money come from for these uh, obvious improvements in public transport? Well, in, in Sweden, uh, the general uh, situation is that the, the taxpayers at the regional level pays for about 50% of, of, of uh, public uh, transport investments, and another 50% comes from, um, from the users, uh, fare box revenues. And then th this looks different in different regions, and some regions, uh, the, the share of tax money share is like 80-75%. And in others, it's uh, 40%. So it, it's a bit different in different contexts. Um, and then, of course, also the national government makes some um, certain investments uh, in order to uh, help and facilitate uh, transition towards electrification, for example, or biogas uh, investments, etc. So it's a mix, I would say, between uh, taxpayer money coming from different levels but mainly on the regional level but also of course it's important with the with the fare box revenues so you always have to consider um the the incomes the revenues and in, in these times of course in the covid uh, era it's uh, it's a challenge also in sweden to raise uh, the money yeah okay thank you john uh kath do you have your question please Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to just ask a clarification question to John um, about you mentioned um, carrots and sticks. Could you just clarify, you know, what these are, what what actually works? Well, there are so many different examples, but uh, I think the, the, my main message is that you can't only work with the carrots because carrots are often very expensive. And if you only want to increase, for example, public transport 
ridership or public transport share only with investments in public transport, that will be very, very expensive and not so efficient. So more efficient and co more also more cost efficient is to combine investments in public transport with um, measures that make car travel less attractive. And that can be road charging, that can be parking policies, that can be uh, planning in cities and, and in countrysides, making it uh, less attractive to use the car. Those measures are often not very popular, uh, so it is a challenge, and therefore I think it's really important that you try to combine uh, packages of measures, both including carrots and sticks, so that you find a good balance between these, because the carrots can also facilitate uh, and make the sticks possible to introduce. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. And finally, Lauren, can we have your question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, a question for Jan again. So we just our group wants to know how the Swedish scheme started or, or what steps you took to get where you are now. And that includes kind of the political support as well as being able to engage members of the public, please. Uh, oh, I mean, this is a process that has been going on for many, many years, decades, uh, of course. And I think for, it has been a strong political commitment, I would say, on the regional level to really make public transport green and also to make public transport uh, a larger share of the transportation system. And um, um, I, I, th I think uh, some of the metropolitan areas has been very important because they are often looked upon as raw uh, models for many of the other regions and they have tried to really invest in public transport and have had the muscles and uh, i think smaller regions have tried to um, follow uh, in their in their steps and so there's been a more or less a political consensus i would say uh, among regional politicals from all parties that public transport is important it's something we have to invest in and it has to cost and we are uh, we are uh, aware of that and we are doing those investments then of course we also have a lot of um, political discussions about uh, the more practical um, measures uh, etc so uh, there are there are um, those uh, aspects, of course, as well. But there's been a long, long-term uh, commitment, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so we have about five minutes left for this Q and A. So does anybody have any questions? Um, any anybody? Kath, you have a, another question there for your group. Yes, we were hoping there might be time. Sorry, Kath, you're on mute. <clears throat> Sorry schoolboy error. Um, we, we were had a discussion around the use of biogas because that came up in um, Jan's presentation. Um, we wondered whether local agriculture, um, because they produce um, biogas, could that be used more for creating um, fuel for public transport systems? Is, is there anything in place currently within the council looking at um, local production of fuels through um, syngas or biogas? I think that's Probably to Ben. Yeah, ben, yeah, ben. I know. Sorry, you're not on this panel. But are you happy to answer that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think in the UK, the the government's really pressing for electrification. That's the national direction, and so I suppose our, our approach has very much been looking at what sustainable uh, fuels there are, but really as a direction going in electrification with the national direction, really. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned yesterday, we're currently working on electric vehicle strategy um but we're not particular i don't think we've got a piece of work looking at biofuels at the same time okay all right thank you ben and we can give some more context um about what heritage council is doing in in a later session if that's helpful anya would you like to ask your question Um, yeah, so this one is a question for Margaret, um, and I was just wondering, the numbers uh, that you present look good, uh, but somebody mentioned in the chat that as a percentage of the population, um, it's not a very high percentage, and I was wondering if you know um, whether the scheme has had uh, kind of decently reduced the 
car emissions because another thing you mentioned was that um a lot of people use the buses as a social thing and i'm thinking that could up the numbers without actually you know they wouldn't be driving if it wasn't for the bus service um so it hasn't necessarily taken that many cars off the roads yeah. Hi there. Thanks. Thanks for your question there, Anya. Actually, there was a slight misrepresentation of the numbers there in the chat box, I noticed. Um, the service I referred to was in Whitney only, with, where there's a population of 28,000. And we're obviously not the only bus service within Whitney. There's quite substantial stagecoach and a local provider called Pullens as well. So that was not uh, necessarily quite the um, accurate outcome. In terms of taking um, drivers off the road, yes, I think we definitely do do that. The question is, what would people have? How would people have travelled if we hadn't? They hadn't had our service. So we know that prior to us, they were using taxis, particularly if they're coming in from the outer areas of the town into this into the town centre, or they would be having if they couldn't uh, drive, they might also or afford a taxi. Then they'd have members of their family who would be giving them trips. So we certainly know that. It, for those particular cases, people have certainly reduced. In our rural service, we know that a lot of um, parents were, were bringing their children into college. And of course, that journey is now no longer required because they do use the bus for us. We also know that quite a few people use us for work when previously they would have used a car. It's very difficult to judge. We've done passenger surveys and we estimate that probably we must save about um, 50 to 60 bus journeys a day across all our services but that is an estimate rather than it being based on any actual fact but it is I think quite substantial and there are a lot of little small journeys as well does, does that help do you have any further follow-up query for that no. we'll move to John please John would you like to to ask your question thank you Margaret yeah got it okay um my question is to John um, our Swedish friend, is with these sticks and carrots, which ones have worked best and given most leverage and which ones in combination have given the best effect? Because he mentioned how one facilitates the other. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I think it, what I think in, in the long term, I think it's, uh, as I said before, uh, there, is, there is not one measure that is uh, solve everything. You have to work with the, the broad packages. But one, one thing that I think is important also for the long term is to, to uh, work with your land use planning uh, so that you create, for example, a dedicated bus lanes uh, or priority for, for public transport. Because what you do then is that you give more space to public transport and you remove some space for personal cars. So it's it's a carrot and a stick uh, in one measure, you could say. And I think those sort of, of investments are important. They're often uh, more relevant in cities, but also people living in rural areas are often traveling to and from cities. So a lot of the cars coming in a city actually are emerged from, from the countryside. So I think that is one good example of, of how you can implement a measure that is both a carrot and a stick at one at one time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Dom, we're going to just squeeze in your question because I'm aware that you we we didn't answer your question when you raised your hand last time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Thank you, yeah. Dom. Um, just to where do the directives for use of alternate fuels come from? Is that from central government? Ben, are you able to answer that? Or Natalia? Uh, I can. So, I mean, the government's made a commitment that by 2030, all, all new motor vehicles need to be, uh, well, they can't be fossil fueled, so they're pushing electrification that way. Um, I don't know if other speakers wanted to jump in, but that, that I suppose, is the key, the key driver there. Um, and again, the government has been putting in a lot of incentive and investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, and I mean, that, that's been, I suppose, the national, the national push that we've been, we've been following and aligning to. OK. OK, we've run out of time, but if I can just thank our speakers very much for their excellent presentations and for joining us uh, for this Q&A. So thank you very much to John and Margaret. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Claire, who's going to explain what you're going to do next. Thanks, Claire. OK, so we've got about 
just under 35 minutes before we're going to break for lunch. So in a minute, I'm going to pass you back over to your facilitators. So you're going to work in small groups again. And we're going to get you to do two exercises, one after another. So the first one is like you did yesterday when you were looking at buildings, you're going to start to answer the question, where might we focus our attention when thinking about reducing emissions from transport? And why do you think that? Um, and then we're going to spend about uh, just under 15 minutes at the end, just thinking about where there might be gaps in your understanding or knowledge so far. So where else might you want information on? What sort of other areas or, or topics? We can't promise we're going to be able to fill all those gaps, but we just want to turn us, take a, the opportunity to, to throw that out to you. Um, you will have another opportunity to respond to that question about gaps um, in a survey that we're going to send you following this weekend, but we're going to start that conversation with your facilitators. So I'm going to hand you back over to Max. You're going to put you in your breakout rooms. We'll see you in about 33 minutes. Lined up for this afternoon, um, and but but quite a lot to get through. Um, but just say uh, welcome back, everybody. Glad to see you back. Uh, you haven't given up on us, which is great. Um, so this afternoon we're going to be covering covering our food, farming, and land use theme. And as I said, we've got some excellent speakers lined up for you. Um, so we're going to go uh, straight into uh, the first set of presentations. Um, so the first one, as with the others, is from Ben Boswell from Herefordshire Council, who's going to be um, giving us some data on emissions from uh, land use in Herefordshire, just to put it into context. So if we can kick off with that one, please, Max. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Boswell, and I'm here to talk to you this afternoon for a quick overview of carbon emissions from land use across Herefordshire. Uh, as you'll see from our overall carbon footprint, uh, agriculture is a key part of our co uh, carbon emissions, uh, accounting for 26% alone. Of that 26%, it's important to note that 22% of that uh, come directly from livestock and crop-related emissions. What that graph doesn't show, though, is actually that uh, as well as producing carbon emissions through the use of land, um, we actually reduce the amount of carbon that's coming from Herefordshire through sequestration. So that's really where all the trees and other vegetation in the county are absorbing carbon, uh, which is what you'd expect in a largely rural county. Um, another way of looking at our carbon emissions is not just around what we produce, but actually about how we consume. So I wanted to show this slide as well, which really shows how the, the produce really from land use, such as food and drink, how that plays into your own carbon footprint. So here you'll see that around 20% of carbon footprint from consumption is directly from food and drink. Uh, it's also nice, or it's also very good to note that um, on the previous slide, it was around 2,000 kilotons of carbon produced in Herefordshire, where actually it's, it's around 1,500 that's actually consumed. So as a county, we consume less carbon than we produce, but that's because of a lot of the goods, services and food and drink that we export elsewhere across the country. Um, what I've also got here is a couple of um, facts and figures uh, to sort of help you have a good understanding of land use in Herefordshire. And, and unsurprisingly, most of the county is, is farmed. And as you can see here, it's about 77% of land. Uh, and in addition to that, which is why you would have seen the large uh, reduction through carbon sequestration, is that we've got 12.6% of the county covered in woodland. Um, and again, if you sort of think back to that first slide where I was showing a lot of uh, emissions from, from livestock, that's largely through methane emissions. And as you can see here, you get a good feel for the amount of livestock in the county. Uh, it's also uh, good to point out that Herefordshire is actually considered to be the most rural county in the, in the West Midlands. Um, again, another way of just looking at the land use, um, really what you can see from here is half of, half of the agricultural land is grassland, quarter for cereal crops, and then the remaining split between arable and fruit and vegetable use. And just a couple of, I suppose, high, uh, key points to end on. Um, as I said, we're an exporter of high quality food and drink, which is very much a key part of our, our local economy. Um, but again, it's it's a really important time for farmers at the moment. There's a lot of change going on through the new environmental act and new legislation, but also new ways uh, and new land management schemes that are being brought in. 
in terms of opportunities you know we've got a lot of really good farming agricultural use there it's about how we turn that into more sustainable and better land management um, but we do have an awful lot of really good practice across the county and you'll hear more about that today um, so if I pass over to the other presenters Thank you, Ben. Um, so we'll take our moment of reflection now. OK, so we'll move on to um, the first longer presentation uh, for this afternoon, which is from Professor Sadita Helm, who's the Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford. And um, Dita is going to be talking to us more about sustainable land use. In thinking about how Herefordshire could uh, move towards a net zero position and think hard about how it can address climate change. I want to focus on the land use dimensions and in particular the other half of the climate change equation which is so often neglected. Climate change is all about the concentrations of carbon and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's about the net of emissions and sequestration. So I want to talk about the sequestration half of that equation. And in a, a county like Herefordshire, with a major a town city at the core and a lot of rural uh, hinterland and a major river uh, flowing through it, land use is probably the area in which uh, the citizens could make the greatest contribution. So. If we think about land use and we think about its component parts, we have to recognise that sequestration of carbon is site specific, whereas emissions are just wherever the emissions happen to take place. Uh, it doesn't matter whether a tonne of carbon is emitted in uh, China to produce steel uh, for local industry or whether it's uh, uh, produced in uh, the UK but it does matter where sequestration takes place. And the reason for that is that uh, carbon is just one dimension of land use and almost anything that we do to reduce uh, carbon emissions from land and to increase sequestration will have uh, impacts on the other natural capitals. And that's site specific. You know, if we're thinking about developing woodland and trees along the riverbank, that's quite different from doing it in upland areas, for example. So what you require to get going is a baseline of what Hereford currently uh, contributes to climate change, and in particular, what the land causes by way of emissions and what the land could sequestrate. And that baseline should include not just the carbon dimensions, but water, air quality, mental and physical health and uh, a variety of other things that we get from nature and what nature gives us for free. So an intelligent approach to uh, mitigating climate change in Herefordshire looks to this local baseline and envisages what uh, Herefordshire could look like in 230, 240, 250 if uh, a number of particular enhancements are advanced. And it's the local citizens who can work out what the opportunities are, but turning those qualitative ideas into quantitative gains so we can measure exactly what uh, Herefordshire achieves is a matter of taking the baseline and hypothesizing what that world looks like in uh, the future. Now, it's pretty obvious that we can hone down on two or three areas where there's likely to be the biggest opportunities. Agriculture is clearly one. It's the source of emissions when it should be the source of sequestration. Its economic output is quite small for the economy as a whole. It's about 0.5% of GDP and it's heavily subsidised. So we can do much better by directing those subsidies towards things which are good for natural capital and also, of course, produce food and away from things which are bad. 
So you only have to look at the river Y and the catchment of the Y to realise how badly we could manage our natural environment. Think of why it's gone green so frequently. Think about the decline of the biodiversity of that river. And it turns out that many of the things which are causing those declines are also things which are associated with emissions of carbon rather than sequestration of carbon. So we should look to the rivers and we should look to the river banks and we should think of ways in which we can, for example, uh, plant tree cover along banks, expand that along river banks to protect those rivers from the runoff that's coming from agriculture and in the process sequestrate carbon. Win-win, win-win-win, not simply the carbon silo uh, approach to these problems. And for the land itself, the new policies in England are all about public money for public goods. Well, that should be a massive opportunity in the net zero frame. Soils have about three to four times the carbon of the atmosphere. So stripping out from the soils the carbon by growing intensive cereals and in particular things like maize, uh, leaching, losing that soil and the carbon in it is not good for the environment, it's not good for the rivers, it's not good for the climate and these are obvious again win-win wins that we should go for. But we can go beyond the rivers, beyond the agricultural landscape and look at our settlements and look at the urban areas like Hereford itself. The great advantage of natural capital is the benefits it brings to us and the closer that natural capital is to the people of Herefordshire, the bigger the benefits are going to be. So if you plant trees in the middle of a city, you clean up the air, you improve mental and physical health, you make the lives of kids better, and you also sequestrate carbon. If you plant those trees in a rural location no one goes to, well, you'll get the carbon benefits, you may get some biodiversity benefits too, but you won't get all those other things which are important for people and their ability to live good lives. And it's no good thinking of, about addressing climate change on its own because it's going to be very expensive however we do it and we need to take people with them with us and why not choose those things which are going to have direct benefits to people not just because of the carbon savings but all the other things go with it and then finally we should think quite hard about how land use gives us resilience against the inevitable climate change that's coming our way. However optimistic you try to be, COP26 tells you the world is not going to deal with climate change in anything like the pace and direction that's required. The temperature of our world will be determined largely in China, India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And COP26 told us that China proposes to go on increasing emissions until 230 and not get to anything like net zero until 260. That's 40 years away. India doesn't propose to get there for 50 years, half a century, and that's 270. Well, we're going to get 2.5 degrees. We're probably going to get more than that. So when we think about how to use the land to reduce carbon emissions, to sequestrate more carbon, we should also do it in ways which build in resilience against what's coming anyway. And that means thinking hard about, again, catchments, about flood defence, about using natural capital ways of reducing the instance of, of flooding, of dealing with drought by planting the right kind of trees in the right kind of places, and helping the communities of Herefordshire to build their own local uh, ability to adapt and be resilient against what is inevitably coming. So in your deliberations, of course, you should think about the emissions from buildings and transport and the physical infrastructure. But remember, you can't do net zero 
without addressing sequestration of the land. And whereas the impact of Herefordshire on the global climate by reducing emissions will be minusculely small, the impact of Herefordshire of using its land better and in a carbon friendly way brings multiple benefits to the people and helps the climate too. So that's why it should be a particular focus of your deliberations. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to Dieter for that presentation. We'll pause for reflection now. Okay, so moving on to um, the next presentation, which is from Dr. Andrew Prentice. Um, Andrew is actually a vet, but he's also part of the 99% organisation and has been doing a lot of research um, around emissions from agriculture in Herefordshire. Hello, my name is Andrew Prentice, and I'd just like to thank you very much for inviting me to speak to the Citizens' Assembly. I've worked as a vet for the last 40 years, most of that in clinical practice uh, in the last year, last few years, um, exclusively on, on environmental and sustainability consultancy. I was asked by the 99% organisation to work on this Herefordshire 2030 project, looking at ways for the county to become fairer, more prosperous and greener by 2030. And we'll be looking at some of the environmental issues here, particularly the greenhouse gas emissions. So if we take a look at this slide, first of all, um, on the base here, we've got economic activity of the county, and it's about four billion pounds a year. Uh, and this box here is the contribution from agriculture. Now, this is slightly surprising because although agriculture and forestry takes up over 95% of the land area of the county, actually it only contributes about 8% of the economy. But um, our real issue here is the greenhouse gases. And Herefordshire as a total produces about 2 million tonnes of greenhouse gases a year. And of those, agriculture produces about 65%, which is very significantly higher than most people expect. Now, the main talk is about carbon dioxide. Actually, agriculture does not produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide, but it does produce a lot of methane and nitrous oxide. And although there is a great deal of variation in the length of time these different greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere, the nature of the crisis and the urgency of the crisis means it's entirely sensible to look at them all together um, at the same time. We need to get all these emissions down as quickly as we possibly can. I would also say that this figure of 65% is the production of greenhouse gases by the county, which is high because we have so much agriculture here. When you look at the consumption figures, which Ben Boswell has done um, and produced figures for, the consumption is about 25%, but it's very much higher on the production side. So that's the scale of the problem we have. So the question is, how can we reduce emissions from food farming and land use in Herefordshire? Well, take that, I suggest, in three such sections. One is the emissions from food. Now, the Drawdown Project has been looking at this for some time, looking for where we can get um, emission savings across every sector. And they've looked at food and farming and food production, and their conclusions are that globally it's pretty clear where the, the biggest um, savings can be made. And that's represented on this chart here. Now, this blue section here, this is all about food waste, and it's over a third of the available savings to us are from food waste. But I'm not going to take, say any more about that because I believe somebody else is going to be talking about this. This red chunk here, this is again an almost, a, almost a third of the available savings for us. And this comes from diet change and a shift to a plant-rich diet. Now, to put that in context, the meat consumption in the UK has dropped by about 17% in the last 10 years. And the national food strategy is that food, that meat consumption should reduce by another 30% in the next 10 years. These are huge changes in our national diet and will inevitably have a big impact on Herefordshire. In addition, The Lancet, the big medical journal, has looked at the question of how can we feed 10 to 11 billion people on this planet by 2050 without increasing the agricultural area? And the conclusion is quite clear, way less red meat and significantly less chicken, pork, fish, and obviously more cereals, more beans, more legumes, and more fruit and veg. Interestingly, the quantity of dairy 
globally can remain about the same. So it, everything suggests we're heading that direction. I mean, you think, well, what will be the impact on Herefordshire? Because if the demand for red meat is reduced by that amount, the, the, the requirement for pasture in the county could also potentially be reduced by as much as 35%. So just hold that thought for a moment because we'll come back to it. Second question is how do we reduce emissions from farming? Well, let's just look at this picture here. We've got the farmers in this area and they're trying to farm. They're trying to produce food and they're trying to look after their land. They are stewards of the land that they occupy. They are surrounded by environmental concerns about their farming practices, about land usage, and they are under pressure for that. But actually they're also stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one side, you have the government with its control over subsidies and regulations, putting an enormous burden on them. We decided as a country we should leave the European Union. That means the common agricultural policy subsidies are going to come to an end. In fact, they've already started to reduce, and by 2027, they will be gone. Theoretically, being re replaced by the environmental land management um, subsidies, and the total budget is supposedly going to be the same but it looks like more people will have, have access to it so the expectation is that farmers will be getting less subsidy and that's very very significant for livestock farmers because those with grazing animals currently divide, derive over 90 percent of their final income from subsidy so on the other side we have the supermarkets and that means us as consumers. The supermarkets have an absolute stranglehold on the pricing for food that farmers are actually paid. At the moment in the UK, we pay an average of 8% of our household income goes on food. That's in comparison to France, which pays about 13%. In Spain, it's 18%. Back in the 1950s in the UK, we spent 40% of our income on food. So food has never been cheaper, which means that farmers are in a worse position than they might otherwise be. So if we want to sort out the emissions from farming, we need to make sure that the government has a subsidy program in place that really does pay them to do the work that we want. And we as consumers need to be prepared to pay properly for the food that we want to eat. So how do we reduce emissions from land use? Well, forgive me more graphs, I'm afraid. Let's just take a quick look at this one here. Um, this is land use in the county. So, and this was 2007, where about half of the land is pasture. And this 20% then is cereals, that's wheat and barley and the like. This is then other horticultural land crops, potatoes, for example, fruit and veg in here. And then this is forest and the gray at the top is built up area. By 2016, that had changed, and there was a little bit less pasture and a little bit more the other crops. And if that continues by 2030, there will be a 10% reduction um, in pasture and an increase in everything else. Now, if the diet changes I was talking about earlier on really do come into play, then suddenly there'll be a big drop off in the amount of pasture land that we actually need. And we could therefore, start producing much more of all the various um, cereal and land crops but that may be more than we need and actually if we were to continue producing the same amount of those crops as we do now then actually suddenly we've got a great big chunk of land here which we could do other things with we could put trees on it and create more forest we could rewild it we could cover some of it in photovoltaic cells and actually generate electricity from it so if we look at this here, this is the carbon footprint of what we do at the moment from, from farming. And at the moment, the vast majority of it actually is coming from ruminants and pasture. And as those changes progress until 2030, you would see a significant reduction there. But if those diet changes come into play, and then we were to choose to use all that extra free land to put trees on it, that is the impact we would have on emissions from agriculture, which would be about a 60% drop on where we are now. So I think that answers your question. Thank you very much. This is the 99% um, Herefordshire 2030 project. If you're interested in what I've been talking about, come and look at us, that's the website. We'd be very happy to have you join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so we'll take our moment of reflection.
Okay, so moving on to our final presentation before the break, uh, and this is from Sarah Faulkner, who's the Regional Policy Manager for the NFU, the National Farmers Union, talking about how UK farming can decarbonise. Thanks, Max. I'm Sarah Faulkner, I'm the NFU's Regional Policy Manager, and this afternoon I'm going to talk about our aspiration to achieve net zero by 2040. So what does net zero mean in a farming context? Agriculture is a biological process, it's essential for food production, and we can't turn it off and we can't switch it easily to alternative measures. So it has to be a gradual process. And there will always be some level of emis emissions associated with agricultural production. So our 2040 net zero ambitions are to reduce the emissions released, from the, released to the atmosphere and also to remove more carbon from the atmosphere. We don't expect that every farm should achieve net zero by themselves, but collectively we think it's achievable to reach net zero across the industry. So some farms will be net emitters and others will be carbon sinks going forward. Our members are asking what should I do and where should I start? And therefore we're focusing our current activity on engagement and encouraging farmers to take their first step along the journey to start to look at opportunities on their farm to try carbon footprinting and to look at benchmarking within sectors carbon footprinting has been a big um, a big focus for the industry there's lots of choice and each carbon footprint would give you an answer a different answer they're not all comprehensive they don't all look at carbon sequestration but the important thing is to start looking into it to start capturing some data and to start to create a baseline from which you can measure improvement agriculture is uniquely placed to be part of the solution as both an emission source and as a sink as farmers, we've got a special role to look after carbon reserves already in our soils and in our vegetation. Agricultural greenhouse gases are very different from other sectors of the economy. Agricultural greenhouse gases tend to be circular and include gases like methane and nitrous oxide, whereas most other sectors of the economy emit carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use. So in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, methane is emitted by livestock and manure management. Nitrous oxide is emitted by soils, fertilisers and manures and carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels in things like tractor diesel and in heat for, for some processes. The hotspots within agriculture tend to be fertiliser use and livestock. Methane has got a high global warming potential and is active for about 30 years and then it breaks down to CO2. Emissions linked to food production are difficult to measure and they tend to be linked to the weather too. But we're tr so we're trying to manage leaky systems within agriculture, but it's important that we start to understand our baselines, start to understand where these greenhouse gases are emitted um, within businesses and look at measures we can take to stop or reduce emissions. This is the result of our first analysis at reaching our net zero aspiration. The left hand bar shows emissions from UK agriculture in 2017 at 45.6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Agriculture represents 10% of UK emissions. The right hand bar shows our initial analysis of how we can get close to achieving net zero. We've used robust sources of evidence for this analysis from the Royal Society and the government's own independent advisors, the Committee on Climate Change, but we've also applied some practical realism to some of the estimates. Our aspiration is going to require more farmers than ever before to undertake practices which are good for their businesses and for tackling climate change. This, the composition of this bar is going to change as new evidence and information becomes available. So at this stage, we're not too worried about the relative contribution of each of the different themes and practices within them. I'm now going to go on and talk about each of these three pillars. So this slide looks at our pillar one activity in more detail and this is all about productivity and it's important to remember that productivity doesn't necessarily mean further intensification it's about making the best use of the resources that we that we use to produce food so many of the measures in, identified in this pillar have also got wider benefits for biodiversity delivery and for water quality improvement and that's particularly important in counties like Herefordshire where you've got the challenges around the River Wye so the first uh, point that we've got there is about nutrient use efficiency so precision fertilizer or slurry application and again it's it's beneficial for the environment because it cuts down on unnecessary passes with tractors which use fossil fuels it cuts down on nitrous oxide emissions but it also cuts down on other nutrient losses so phosphate to water for example 
We're also looking at feed efficiency, so making sure that livestock are being fed appropriately, they're not being given um, excess nutrients, um, which again has an impact on the quality of the slurry and the manures that they produce, but also the greenhouse gas emissions through things like methane. We're also looking at genetics because again, the, the animal breeding can have a, a role in, in, in reducing methane, reduction, uh, methane production, which is really important for the livestock sector. Then in terms of arable and grassland production, we're looking at soil management, preventing compaction, making sure soils are healthy, um, making sure the soils are storing carbon. And then we're also looking at energy efficiency within buildings. And again, a really important one is farm building modernisation and ensuring that farming businesses have got access to the very best infrastructure so that they can run clean, sustainable businesses. Pillar 2 looks at adding carbon to the farmed landscape through a variety of measures. So, for example, looking at how farmers can add organic material to soil to increase the amount of carbon they store through adding materials like manures or other products, looking at the multiple benefits that can be delivered for soil health and for water retention through managing grasslands more effectively, and then boosting hedges and tree cover on farm. Pillar 3 is about renewal, renewables and the bioeconomy, and we think it's a reasonable aspiration for all farms to be involved in some form of energy generation in the future. And there will probably be more opportunities as time moves on, but there are also things that we can do right now. For example, adding solar PV units onto farm building roofs, and a lot of farmers have already gone down this road. So in terms of what we're doing to support our members along this journey, we've got a wealth of resources online. Um, they're relevant for farmers, but also relevant for, for other members of the public as well. These include um, our net zero farm status indicator, which helps is a decision making tool which helps farmers to choose which carbon uh, calculator they should use in the future. We've also got a range of case studies showing what farmers are doing right now and encouraging other farmers to look into the opportunities. We've got documents which um, look at the 26 ways that farmers are already doing their bit for, farm for net zero. So I'd really encourage everybody to go and take a look. As you can see, there's a lot of work in progress. And just to pick a few things out, we've got our We're In It For Net Zero pledge campaign where farmers are signing up to achieve net zero. We've got the work that we're doing on carbon offset markets. This is going to be really important in the future. And we know that our members have already been contacted by various organisations and asked to get involved. But like any new and emerging market, there are pitfalls as well as opportunities. And we're doing our very best to make sure that farmers are supported when entering this market. We're doing some work on the new environmental land management scheme and running a test and trial there to look at ways that we can implement net zero within the ELM scheme. And that's really important because we need to make sure that future environmental delivery looks at all aspects. So looking at biodiversity, looking at soil management, but also looking at climate and net zero as well. And then finally, we've done a lot of work um, around the COP26 and the countryside COP it was a really important um, opportunity to draw everyone's attention to the important role the countryside and food production can play in achieving net zero going forward. My final slide just flags up our Hedges and Edges campaign, which highlights what can be done if we increase the amount of carbon storage within hedges and also improve their functionality as biodiversity and wildlife corridors. So this afternoon, I've just given you a snapshot of what we're doing with our members at the NFU and our aspiration to achieve net zero. And thanks ever so much for listening. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the presentation. Um, Sarah is unable to join us for Q&A, but we will be joined by Bill Kwan, who's the county chairperson. Um, so we'll take our moment for reflection on that presentation, please. Thank you. OK, so as before, um, we're going to move you into your small groups now so you can come up with your key questions for the speakers as a group. Um, so just to remind you, we're going to be joined by Bill Kwan and also Andrew Prentice. Uh, Dieter Helm wasn't able to join us for Q&A. Thank you. You've got 15 minutes now with your group. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're joined now by Andrew Prentice and Ben Boswell. Unfortunately, Bill Kwan hasn't yet joined us, but he may do as we go through the Q&A. Um, so if we can kick off, please, with our um, first question, which is from, for Mary, from Mary's group this time. Okay, I hope I hope I do this one justice. Um, this is really this is really for um, the council. 
um, and the group just needed a bit of clarity on how much the council can actually influencing influence land use and farming. We get the housing, we get the transport, but we're not clear about what remit the council has, particularly in lines of subsidies and also, for example, encouraging tree planting and the land ownership issues that might be involved with that. Thank you, Mary. Are you happy to answer that, Ben? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it fully. I might need to, to check with some colleagues to um, to give it a fuller answer, but um, the council does have, have an influence and yes, you're, you're absolutely right, it is limited. Um, and through, through the planning system, as, as new developments come on board and the council obviously shapes um, that. So uh, say for, for new developments out there, we can say that we need, uh, we do require trees and um, sustainable urban drainage um, and sort of examples like that. In terms of farming, it's a bit more limited. We do have a regulatory role with um, the sort of environmental health training standards side, but it is, it is more limited than uh, normally. Um, I see Natalia who wants to jump in, but I'd probably need to check with some colleagues really to give you a fuller answer on that. Thank you, Ben. Yes, Natalia, can we come to you, please? Yeah, just very briefly. So you, you would have gathered that we don't give subsidies to farmers, but we do work in partnership with farmers and we find that they are very willing to work with us and Herefordshire Council is one of the leaders in the community, so we do have some influence, even though we might not be able to do some of that, that direct subsidy. I mean, also one of the things which we do want to look at coming out of here is recommendations about how we work in partnership with organisations and businesses like farmers and what incentives we can use. So things like tree planting, other authorities have, have done that. And I think what we will learn from the presentation is being smart about that. I suppose that's one of the things that we, you know, very interested to explore about how we can influence people um, through partnerships or financial incentives. Yeah. OK, thank you, Natalia. Um, OK, so we're going to move to Paul now for the group for the question from your group, please, Paul. Thanks, Sarah. Um, question from well, one of the questions from our group was um, the, the question around animal waste and could that be used as a source of alternative energy? Andrew, is that something you're able to answer? Uh, yes. Um, the, the very short answer to that is yes. And uh, some of that animal waste can be and is being used. My understanding is that there are a number of um, centres that are actually looking for authorization at the moment for um, using animal waste as uh, a potential power source. Um, and that's, that's, you know, perfectly viable. The issue, of course, is that if you're looking at burning animal waste as a power source, then you're actually going to be putting carbon back into the atmosphere. And that's a problem. So there are a number of ways you can use animal waste. You can use it in anaerobic digestion, which is then where you're producing gas, which can then be used um, uh, to fuel power stations or generators of one sort or another. But I think we have yet to develop the really good technology for extracting carbon from that process. Because if you can imagine, it doesn't matter whether you're burning coal or gas or, or uh, animal waste or whatever it is, you're going to produce carbon dioxide from that. And the real technological breakthrough that, that needs to be done at scale is to extract the carbon dioxide from that burning process and turn it back into a solid form or some form that we can get back into the ground. So not really a solution for reducing emissions, are you saying? Well, not as it stands at the moment. I mean, this is, here we're talking about um, not so much with animal waste, but, so, but with other biological products. So bioenergy, carbon capture and storage is the process, BEX. And that um, is, we have the proof of concept there that has been done on an experimental and small scale basis that actually the carbon can be extracted from the burning process and then you can get it back into the soil. What we don't have yet is that at real scale that could deal with the, 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 the scale of the problem that we have right now. So in, the principle is there, but the practicality is not yet. Okay, 
Thanks, Andrew. And also, just to let people know, though we haven't been joined by the NFU this afternoon, we are being joined by Ben Taylor Davis, um, who's also known as Regen Ben, who's a farmer in Herefordshire. So any farming specific question, uh, we will also be able to ask directly to Ben. I, I would I would also say at the risk of being controversial, I mean, the, the NFU has come up with a, a very ambitious project to get agriculture in the UK to carbon net zero by 2040, which is very laudable, very, very uh, proud of them for having done that. But it is very dependent on being able to capture the carbon from the combustion process. And I think uh, realistically, that's a little bit of a weakness in, in the plan. OK, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Kath, can we come to you, please? Um, yes, like Mary, I'm hoping I do this question justice. Um, ours was um, around the question of um, cereal production, um, that the, um, our group felt there was a slight conflict in the presentations, where one, we were talking about how intensive farming of things like cereals is bad for the land. And then uh, on another part of the, one of the presentations, it looked at how we want to increase cereal production if we're going to be eating less meat. Um, so I'd like to know um, how you square this with um, more of a vegetarian stroke vegan diet, which relies on um, a certain amount of inputs. Um, does it mean that the carbon um, output is shifting just to somewhere else in the world? That's to Anne. <laughs> it was about mm -hmm. sort of, uh, food production security really in this country. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it's complicated. Uh, there is a move to less meat consumption. This is true. Um, and that does mean that, that our diet will be more reliant on non-meat inputs. Um, The, 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 the issue, though, is that, that producing cereals and other horticultural crops is generally more efficient in terms of input than actually um, producing meat. And therefore, you don't need to use quite so much land to produce the amount of food energy that we all need to eat. So um, there is a conflict between the two. Uh, and on a certain, there's a large acreage, there's a large area of land that's actually need, needed to produce meat animals uh, for, the, for the food chain. You can use much, much smaller area of land to produce non-meat foods. That's the bottom line. And so that makes a big difference. And that's why there is, it's one of the environmental reasons for shifting to a lower meat diet at the moment. But that doesn't mean to say that everybody needs to go to vegetarianism and veganism because actually, animals in agriculture have a really important role to play. And if they're used wisely and sensibly, they are a really, really important part of the entire agricultural cycle. I don't know if that really answers your question properly or not. I think, um, I, I hope it does sort of um, on behalf, but I don't know whether it sort of covers the food security issue about um, the, you know, the fact that we potentially would be importing more um, cereals and grains and shifting our um, carbon footprint to other countries producing and transporting um, increased amounts of non-meat products. Right. Well, the issue at the moment is that um, a lot of the, the food that is fed to animals is actually imported into this country. About a half of the wheat and barley that we produce in this country actually goes into animal feed. Right. But also a lot of the animals, particularly uh, pigs and chickens, there's a, a significant amount of soya that they're fed and large amounts of that is currently imported from other countries. So um, food security is a major issue and we are in an insecure position at the moment because we are net importers of food. Um, so it will it will change that dynamic. But it's, it's, it is very complicated. And at the moment, we are importing vast amounts of food, which we then feed to animals, which we then eat. And that's a very inefficient process. It's inefficient because those, a lot of those um, food products are being grown in other countries where deforestation is taking place. Plus, they're often farmed in very intensive ways. They're then shipped halfway across the world. They come here and then they're fed to animals, which in itself is an inefficient process. So the net effect 
on food security of moving to a more plant-rich diet would be it would improve our food security thank you Okay, can we move to you, Lauren, for the question from your group? Yes, um, I'm merging two in a way. What's stopping us getting on with planting along the riverbanks and us, I think we've discussed that being landowners and farmers potentially, and for individuals, just some advice on where we can go to get good consistent advice on what trees to plant if we're in the position to do that ourselves. Okay. Um, Andrew, are you able to answer the first part of that question? I'm wondering, Ben, whether you could answer the second part. What's stopping us planting more trees? Um, actually, I'm not sure I, do, I'm not sure I really can answer no. that, because it's, it's very clearly something we ought to be doing on every level. Um, the 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 one of one of the many problems we're really facing is we've got to get some of that carbon out of the atmosphere and into the ground and trees is something that is available at scale right now and going and planting a tree this afternoon when this when this session finishes means that immediately starts taking some carbon in the direction we wanted to go now but there's a big difference between individuals doing that and at the other extreme major government projects for reforesting um, and that's on a more macro level and there is a commitment to putting 30,000 hectares of new forest in the ground every year um, over the next few years. Now we've not managed to do that as a country so far and actually 30,000 hectares is probably nowhere near enough, nowhere near enough. So you've got the, the sort of the, the, the difference between the individuals who go out and say, well, I'm going to put three more trees in my garden this week and, and, and government scale. And in between that, we've got local action and we need to find ways to enable that and to make sure that people actually either as, as either as individuals or groups or local communities to actually start doing this more. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So we have been joined by Helen Stace, who's actually going to be presenting in our next set of presentations and joining us for the final Q&A. And I've noticed that Helen's put something in the chat about um, advice on which trees to plant where. So I don't know whether people would like to pick up on that. Maybe we can ask Helen about that for the next um, question. Uh, Brian and Richard, I'm away, you had your hand up. I just want to go to the final group, if that's okay, before we uh, open it up. So, and that's Vicky. Do you have your question, please? Um, yes, I do. Uh, I think behavioural change, I don't know whether um, the right people are here to ask the question, so I'm going to throw it out, and if not, I've got another question. How do we change behaviour to help better affordable diets and the food mal issue? Does anyone can answer that question? Um, I will say, Vicky, that also in our next set of presentations we have um, Emily O'Brien in fact I think Emily is also here but from Food Matters that may be a, a more appropriate question for Emily unless Andrew or Ben have anything specific that they want to say on that. I, I can answer an, another question if okay. not. Okay yes please. Um, yeah. So we had a question on the state of the why and I don't think we'll go there right this minute um, but the other question which I think was quite interesting I didn't, um, was the comparison of Herefordshire, this is for Ben, I think, to the rest of the UK in terms of our carbon production, how we're doing um, in sequestration and other things. I don't think that came up in your, and a couple of people asked about that. Thanks, Vicky. Okay, I think um, it was quite helpful because I think Andrew touched, I uh, know Sarah actually said, I think the statistic of uh, aquaculture across the UK is an average of 10%, uh, whereas in Herefordshire it's 26%. So obviously it's a, it's a lot more in Herefordshire, but that, that's what you would expect for an agricultural county. Um, so what was the second part of that question? Um, I know it was the comparison to the rest of the UK. The other part was, was um, oh, was the, yeah, the, the question I mentioned was the state of the why, which I think possibly you probably okay, don't I, want to mention talk about particularly well, whether I, think, um, I mean i think you also mentioned sequestration because i think yes i'll come back onto why after but uh on sequestration i think i showed a graph yesterday that showed that uh, herefordshire has i think it's somewhat like five to uh, about ten percent of 
our emissions are essentially offset by sequestration at the moment. Whereas um, if you looked at the West Midlands average, national average, it was probably closer to about 2% or so. So it's significantly higher in Herefordshire. Um, I also think that might be an underrepresentation at the moment because there's some new data sets being worked on and it could be significantly higher than that. So we're, we're working on that at the moment. Um, and I suppose just touching on, on the why, I think the examples people have been saying of, you know, could we do more planting along riverbeds? Well, I mean, that has significant benefits to stop nutrient runoff as well, which has, you know, a, an added benefit to help with the, the health of the river and trying to reduce nutrients going into the river. So it, it actually is a really good benefit for biodiversity, water quality and carbon sequestration. Okay, thanks, Ben. So is everyone conscious of time? And I just want to come to Brian. We have now actually been joined by Bill, um, who's the county chairperson for the NFU. Um, ben, I, uh, Bill, I can't see you on my screen, but we'll come to you in a second if that's okay. But Brian, would you like to ask your question? Can Brian unmute, Max? Thank yeah. you. Um, I've been uh, sure by Kath that the questions can be asked, but I think it's something that the uh, Assembly should be aware of. Okay. I'm aware of some recent research into the use of carbon char as a feedstock additive, um, which significantly reduces methane um, production from cattle, um, has health benefits, um, and obviously the manure going into the ground is carbon rich um, and absorbs nutrients far better than current. Uh, are the panel of experts aware of this? Is this something that's being considered? It's, it's, it's very new research, but I have details of the doctor that's been conducting this research, if, if you'd like okay. to see them. Thanks, Brian. I think I'm going to go straight to Bill for that on that question. If I, Bill, are you? Yes. Um, do you have an, uh, an answer to that? You are now off mute. Well, firstly, may I apologise because I didn't actually get the link till just recently. Oh, so right. I've missed Sorry about most of your valuable con contributions, but um, carbon, phosphates, these these are probably the two main issues fa facing Herefordshire farming at the moment. And, you know, we all use the best practice that we have in the, in the circumstances in which we're operating. So um, as technology advances, as know-how develops, um, we're, we're uh, changing our techniques to meet the demands not of a, not only of our customers but in in the end the consumer so there are many techniques um, targeting nutrients um, cutting waste out of the system not wasting nutrient or feed stocks of any form it's taking the best um, management of fertilizers you you will all be aware that we're now not, not um, allowed to spread manures over the winter which therefore reduces the amount of runoff so it's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing feast so we, we as as the rules and regulations and the demands of our clients alters we have to move to meet the challenge and whether it be um, use of uh, chemicals and targeting chemicals or use of nutrients or the um, physical cultivating of the land for instance we're trying to reduce the amount of plowing that goes on because that obviously reduces uh, releases carbon and it in, it also adds to runoff with the freak weather conditions that we're all having to cope with during climate change so min till strip till it's not it's it, it is, is it a technology that's being harnessed at the moment okay and, Thank, thank you, Bill. So I'm conscious of time because we have to finish this Q&A shortly. Um, Andrew, I think you wanted to, you had a response directly to Brian's question. Uh, well, yes, it's just a, the, the previous issue and uh, talking about methods to get behavioural change to, to change the way that, that people eat. And I, I just think it was really interesting that the, the two single biggest factors that have been, been identified that would help reduce the greenhouse gas production from agriculture, farming, food production, are just human behavioural changes. It's nothing, and, and the, the, any changes within the system of agriculture itself is, is one thing. But actually, if you can get people to change the way that they eat and stop wasting so much food at every stage, 
then that's already a big step forward. It's hopeless if we've got farmers who are going through all this incredible effort to actually put food into the shops and then it doesn't get eaten. That's the biggest scandal of all, really. Okay. So, it's, but the, so these two huge issues are all just about human behavioural change um, rather than agriculture itself. Okay, That's thank you, Andrew, and thank thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so, just to remind you, this afternoon we will be joined by Emily Brian O'Brien and Helen Stace, who have already responded to some of those questions which people have been raising in chat. So, um, Brian, hold on to your point, and anybody else, hold on to theirs, and th hopefully there'll be the opportunity to raise them again. Um, later on. So thank you all. We're going to go for a break now. Uh, it's a five minute break. I'm sorry to be this precise, but please can you return at 3.01? Um, so five minutes and we'll see you back here at 3.01. Thanks ever so much. Feel free to turn screens off. Okay, so the, the magic hour has come. We're at 3.01. So we are now going to move into our second part uh, of this session which is specifically looking at food consumption, some of what we've, we've touched on, and production, uh, creating a nature-rich county and regenerative farming. So the first uh, speaker of this panel um, is an, our expert by experience. He's commonly known as Regen Ben, but his actual name is Ben Taylor Davis, um, and he's a local farmer. So if Max, if we can share his presentation, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to my presentation, albeit brief, about our farm in ross on uh, My name is Ben Taylor Davis, I'm also known as Regen Ben. We farm just outside ross on in Brunton Abbots. Um, here you can see the, the side of our farm building in which we've had it transformed into uh, how we were farming uh, up until about six or seven years ago, and how we aspire to farm now, um, which includes an awful lot of what we're actually doing. And this is uh, open and more than welcome for people to come and visit at any time. So the title for my talk is, How Can We Reduce Emissions from Food, Farming and Land Use in Hereford? The biggest issue with agriculture is uh, it's a net polluter. Um, tillage um, and um, moving soil, artificial fertilisers, uh, runoff of, of course, phosphate that we're all very familiar with. Uh, and actually making the, the, the fertiliser through the Harbour Bosch process is, is, is hugely uh, energy inefficient. So there are, um, we're faced with some huge problems in terms of we are certainly a net polluter of, of carbon dioxide as, as a whole, as an industry. And it's something we're having to re-look re at and readdress and start to understand how we might actually mitigate these problems. I think um, these are some of the worst c cases in the area, um, but it's photographs I've certainly taken in and around Herefordshire. And I think it's a very case in point. We really need to start um, taking responsibility and understanding that we really can't start keep treating our soil like dirt. Um, me as a farmer, um, when I consider the actual thing I own, which really and truthfully is soil, um, how can we actually afford to lose uh, soil um, down the road or essentially down the drain losing money down the drain as you can see in this infograph uh, and, and it's all these sorts of problems with with, um, with what, what we're doing and how we're doing it and the realisation that uh, soil is this living organism and perhaps we, sh we need to spend an awful lot more time focusing on this as you can see uh, unfortunately the largest UK export by weight is soil, and you can see the seven estuary and all around the UK on this satellite photograph. And it's something we really need to take responsibility for. Uh, it's not a lot of use if soils ending up in the river and in the seas, uh, causing all sorts of pollution issues out there. We are starting to see dead zones in the Bristol Channel and the uh, seven estuary. Uh, and of course, if I haven't got any soil, it's very hard to farm. There are, however, five principles of soil health that we look at uh, trying to um, follow uh, on our own farm in, in Ross and Wye here, and, and they are as follows. We look to limit uh, the disturbance, and that includes mechanical, so that's tillage, of course, ploughing uh, and, and all the things that go with um, mechanical tillage, but also chemical and physical disturbance of the soil. 
So it's very important that in actual fact, if we go no-till, that's fantastic. But we have to be very careful the amount of chemicals and fertilizers, and certainly artificials that are applied to the soil, because they have as large a detrimental effect as mechanical and physical uh, soil disturbance. Armour. Uh, we have to keep the soil covered at all times. Bare soil is an anomaly. Nature always works to cover soil. That's where we end up with weeds, or what we classify as weeds. It's literally nature just looking after and protecting her very, very precious soil surface. Diversity. We need to strive for diversity of both plant and animal species. If you look anywhere where nature uh, gets an opportunity, it, it puts huge amounts of diversity wherever it possibly can, whether you see roadside verges and see the amount of plants and species that are, uh, are, are growing in roadside verges, and yet we grow huge areas of, of monocrop species and wonder why we end up with problems. Living roots. We need to maintain living roots in soil as long as possible throughout the year. These living roots are feeding soil biology, providing its basic food source, carbon. This biology in turn fuels the nutrient cycle that feeds plant. This is essential. And the integration of animal. Nature does not function without animals. It is really quite that simple. Um, this is quite an interesting uh, photograph of root exudates. So this is actually what's pouring out of roots, out of plants. Because what we need to understand is when we're talking about carbon and sequestering carbon, uh, there's a lot of carbon in the ear of my wheat plant, but 33% of that is moved and made into bread. 30% oxidizes to uh, CO2, and, and most of that um, ends back at the atmosphere. A very small part of that plant, 3%, ends back on my soil. But the really important stable carbon is that that is exuded in those, um, from those roots. And as you can see in this uh, diagram, in this uh, Petri dish, um, They've, they've captured this amino rich carbon. We need to understand everyone is a livestock farmer, and there's an awful lot of people that, that, that deny that there are actually livestock farmers. But of course, most of our livestock is invisible, and as you can see, this is some photographs from under a microscope looking at soil and soil life, bacteria, nematodes, protozoas. Uh, and of course, we have to feed this livestock like you would above ground, but below the ground, and take no days off. Because soil microbes in a healthy soil have the weight of five cows per hectare. Most UK soils, unfortunately, have only about a hundredth of this. And these soil microbes actually love the exudates that come out these um, come out of roots. If you haven't got any roots, unfortunately, they, they, they feed on dead plant roots. And if they haven't got any dead plant roots, they, they, they feed on crop residues. And the worst thing of all, if none of the above are available, they actually start feeding on organic matter. Organic matter being um, the huge amount of carbon that we're trying to store in soils. So you reduce the quantity and quality of organic matter. This is the integration of, of, of a farm here, of, of livestock. Uh, we actually mob graze a flood. I haven't got an awful lot of time to talk about mob grazing. But it's something that we demonstrate here on the farm. And we're actually opening up a walk to explain how this works around the farm. But hopefully you can see a swallow, you can see... The diversity of animals all together. We've got um, cows, sheep in here, goats, alpacas, and pigs. Uh, this was absolutely buzzing with insects as well, and uh, and um, brown hares. So it, it, it's just a wonderful um, picture of, of, of profitability, but also uh, environmental gains. Um, poultry producing, or why not why not graze your poultry on herbal lays like we are doing here? Not only does it provide a fantastic food source and, and healthy environment in which the poultry can, can live, they get moved constantly, which means we don't end up with any bare soil and pollution and an awful lot of phosphates entering the Y. On the right-hand side, funny enough, we've got maize here growing. Um, I have my wife Helen stood next to it just for scale. We've applied no nutrients at all. That includes manures or artificials. It had no herbicides. And we plant an understory of clover to protect pr protect the maize. And like I said, we certainly have choices. Uh, here is some maize, as you can see, that they're, um, on the left-hand side here, where we've planted um, ryegrass between the, the maize crop, protecting the soil, holding the soil all the way through. The maize then grows up ahead. And um, and when it comes to harvest, the, the grass is still there under the um, 
under the maze canopy, protecting and holding the saw together, and also providing um, some extra forage if, if required. On the right hand side, of course, is pretty much the general um, photograph of, of how maize looks after it's been harvested with a, with a fairly wet autumn. So our small farm here in front of us, phosphate use for harvest 2012, 2021 even, absolutely zero. What impact did it have on yield? Zero. We only own 0.5% of the River Y frontage. But I think it's a really important start to demonstrate that there are ways in which we can reduce phosphate, reduce carbon, reduce all our emissions and actually become far more sustainable by using compost and, and, and mob grazing and looking after soils and enhancing what is essentially the most um, incredible carbon store we have. And I think the most important thing for me, if you think you're too small to make a difference, uh, try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> so for me... I'd just leave, I'd like to leave it as a thank you uh, and my Twitter handle um, where I spend quite a lot of time um, calling out bad and good practices in UK agriculture. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. We're now going to take just a, a moment of reflection and remembering that time just to capture any questions you've got down for our panel. OK, so we're now going to move on to our second presentation, which is uh, Helen Stace, who is Chief Executive of Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. And she's going to talk a little bit about how to achieve zero carbon and nature a nature rich Herefordshire. Thanks, Max. Hello, I'm Helen Stace, Chief Executive of the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, the only charity covering all aspects of wildlife across the county. So in talking about how do we make Herefordshire zero carbon and nature rich, I'm going to focus on the nature rich reach bit. I'll explain a bit about the nature crisis, talk about our vision for the sort of county we think Herefordshire should be, and think about what we and you can do together. Nature is in crisis and suffering catastrophic declines. The State of Nature report, last issued in 2019, is a regular and definitive health check compiled by 50 conservation organisations. It's well worth reading if you have the time, though a bit depressing, and you can get it off the internet. It shows that many species are suffering a catastrophic decline in abundance. Once common species are becoming scarce, scarce species are becoming rare, rare species are going extinct. Britain has lost 133 species already since the 16th century, and 1,200 species are currently under threat. Some species are on the increase, but they're mainly the vigorous common species that tolerate pollution and can oust the more delicate species. Think about nettles on road verges. There are many drivers of change, as this slide shows. Agriculture has had the single biggest impact over the last eight decades, initially through grubbing up woodland and ploughing of meadows for farmland, but increasingly due to pollution and other impacts of farming. But climate change impacts are now taking their toll and are the second biggest threat to wildlife. So things are not looking good for wildlife. The climate is changing fast, even in the West Midlands, and the pace of change is accelerating. Annual average temperatures are increasing. The growing season is getting longer. Rain patterns are changing. There's less rain in the summer and more in the winter. So there'll be more droughts, more floods and more stormy weather. Wildlife just can't cope with the changes. It can't adapt fast enough to the changing weather patterns and it can't move through the countryside to escape the change. Some species respond faster than others, but that in itself causes problems. Think about the chiff chaff. They're small birds that feed their nestlings on those caterpillars that eat the new lung leaves of trees. If the trees come in to leaf earlier because the spring starts sooner, but the chiff chaff still nests at the usual time, they miss the main flush of caterpillars and can't feed their babies. And that sort of dilemma is repeated in many aspects of wildlife. Herefordshire has already suffered many changes. The change has been gradual, so many people have not noticed, crept up on us unawares. 
Older people may have forgotten the flowery woodland thickets and hedgerows, the flocks of lapwing and the bubbling curly of their youth. But younger people don't even realise what they're missing. Herophytia flatters the deceived. It looks like a green and pleasant land, but it's lost so much of its wildlife. Less than 5% of Herefordshire is managed for wildlife at the moment, but government has set a target of 30% managed for nature by 2030. So how can we help make Herefordshire a county with thriving nature? We need space for nature across our farmland and reaching into the heart of our towns and villages. We need healthy natural rivers and floodplains, providing clean water and reducing flooding. This picture shows the River Wye 25 years ago, before many of the riverside meadows were ploughed up and lost. You can see white drifts of water buttercup flowers on the surface. As many of you will know, because it's been in the news a lot recently, water buttercup has gone into massive decline, as has much of the other river wildlife, due to soil, fertilisers and chicken manure washing into the river to pollute the water. That's something that needs to change and change fast. We need flowery meadows, commons and orchards full of colour and buzzing with wildlife. So we can't afford to lose any more to development. We need natural woodlands alive with birdsong and carpeted in flowers. These photographs are also older photographs and many woodlands aren't like this anymore because there are too many deer in the woodlands grazing out all the flowers, shrubs and young trees. And with no young trees to replace the old trees as they die, the woodlands are effectively dying on their feet and we need to act now to reverse that. We want road verges, hedgerows and village greens managed for wildlife, not mown or cut to extinction in an excess of tidiness. We want wild spaces within 10 minutes of every home so everyone can benefit from being close to nature. This haze of purple in this slide is Devil's Bit Scabious, I love that name, on Coal Village Green. Here my son used to chase grasshoppers, butterflies and ghost moths. Thanks to Coalwell Parish Council, this site is still there and being well managed, so all those species have survived for future generations of children. So how do we make this happen? Regen Ben has already explained the multiple benefits of regenerative farming, making space for nature, saving our soils, trapping carbon and stopping pollution. We need to establish more trees. I expect you've been hearing a lot about that, but it's not just about tree planting. We can thicken up our hedgerows and our hedgerow trees to grow. We can replace the fallen apples in our traditional orchards. After all, they're one of the main features of Herefordshire that people come to visit. We can fence deer out of woodlands to allow trees to set seed and grow again, and we can encourage natural regeneration. For rivers, we need to restore wildlife in the headwaters and on the floodplains to provide natural flood management and to allow the river wildlife to re-establish. And we need to re-green our towns and cities, making more space for wildlife. So generally, we just need to make more space for nature and to meet government's target of 30% of land managed for nature by 2030. Their hope lies in the creation of nature recovery networks. That means more nature reserves and green spaces, bigger green spaces, better managed green spaces, and better connected landscapes to allow wildlife to respond to climate change. So the mantra is more, bigger, better, better connected. So if that's one thing you take away from today, remember that more, bigger, better, better connected. There are many natural benefits of taking this approach. As Dieter Helm has explained, we would have more nature for people to enjoy. People would have better mental and physical health and improve well-being. And Herefordshire would be a greener place to live in and visit. We could have better flood control and less erosion of soils and river pollution. We could lower emissions and have better carbon sequestration. We could have cleaner and more plentiful fresh water and locally grown healthy food. And in towns and cities, <clears throat> the trees and new green spaces would be improvements to the air quality and shading for buildings and homes. Nature can be good for us. As Dieter says, it's a win-win-win. 
So how can we help? How can you help? To quote Tolkien and Greta Thunberg, no one is too small to make a difference. So you can act now and do lots of things. You can get closer to nature. Get out there to see and enjoy nature and wildlife. Introduce your children and your grandchildren to nature. As David Attenborough says, no one will protect what they don't appreciate and they won't appreciate what they haven't experienced. Speak up for nature or calls for action. Challenge those in, your, in power. Write to your MP. Persuade your local town and parish councils to do more of their green spaces and get your other community organisations to do their bit. Act for nature. Join Herefordshire Wildlife Trust's team Wilder. We're working towards a wilder Herefordshire. Or volunteer in your local community. Act wherever you think you can make a difference. Lead by example. Adopt a more sustainable lifestyle. Consume ethically. Rewild your garden. Feed the birds. Reduce your carbon footprint and reduce your use of plastic. Or join the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. You could become a member and persuade others to join or support our appeals and help us to raise funds. Every bit helps. So let's make Herefordshire nature rich. In your discussions later on, I hope that you will help make sure that the Citizens Assembly delivers on its promise to make Herefordshire nature rich. We need more space for nature or bigger, better, better connected. We need to let nature help in delivering solutions for a win-win-win. And we need to ensure we get the funding we need to do this. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, lots of food for thought there. So we're just going to take a moment to pause and reflect and note down any questions you might have for Helen at the Q&A. Okay, so our final speaker as part of this panel um, is Emily O'Brien from Food Matters, and she's going to talk to us about food and climate change. Thanks, Max. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily O'Brien. Thank you so much for asking me to talk to you today about food and climate change. I'm just going to try and share some screen, uh, share some slides with you to help me explain what I'm talking about. And here we go. So I work for an organisation called Food Matters um, and Food Matters works on a national programme, Sustainable Food Places, which means we work with and support food partnerships all around the country, including Herefordshire Food Partnership. So the main point that I want to make today, which I'm sure is, has already been made by some speakers, but just to stress it, is actually food and farming, so not just the farming element, but the whole bit of it, the whole transport and retail and processing, the whole lot is actually a really important part of your um, individual carbon footprint. So the food you eat will contribute between a quarter and a third of um, all of the global greenhouse gases that you're responsible for. And that's true of each one of us. So it's a really, really big part of it. Um, and as well as that, um, food is also the food system agriculture and the rest of it it's also a huge part around um, biodiversity and nature so the whole uh, biodiversity crisis uh, agriculture is a massive part of um, of of causing some of the impact on that um, our health as well and of course our economy especially somewhere like Herefordshire where you have a lot of farming um, and it's also, also, of course, food's really been really, really important, particularly in the last couple of years around the whole food access and food poverty agenda as well. So people being able to access a healthy diet and afford to do so. So um, that's why it's important. Um, but what can, why do something about it locally? Um, well, what we what we found, and I should say that my colleagues um, I work with in Sustain, whose logo's at the bottom, they prepared these slides. I've done terrible things to them. Don't tell Sustain. Um, but they, they did some research and they found that three quarters of all councils had declared a climate emergency. But when it came to climate action plans, only a third of those councils had included food in that action plan. So I suppose what's a really good sign is that you're having this session at all. Sometimes it's completely overlooked, even though it's such a big part. And of course, what's really important as well is that it, um, food and farming can deliver healthy and sustainable diets, but also help your farmers and everyone else further down the chain. And there is quite a lot that can be done on that locally. Uh, so this slide I don't want you to look at, it's just to show you really a bit 
quite how complicated it all is. Um, so the key bits I want to focus on are the fact that farming emissions in the UK are around 29% of, um, of, of food and farming emissions. So that's actually a big proportion of it. So doing something around agriculture and farm emissions is really important. And I know you've got some local figures that I think are fairly similar to that. Um, but also to say it is a complicated picture and there are lots of other bits of the system. So stuff that's grown abroad, um, that's almost a quarter of that is, is from stuff abroad. And the final thing to say, it's really important to notice that the emissions from food waste in the UK are nearly a quarter of all those emissions, 23%. I've also been asked to talk a little bit about diet. Um, obviously, the key, uh, the thing to say around um, diets is that meat and dairy, which has been getting a lot of focus recently, does have a higher carbon footprint. That's absolutely true. But what I really want to say is that actually there's a huge difference. Uh, so if you look at the top of your screen where it's got beef on it, so there's a massive difference between the different types of beef and what that means for their carbon footprint. So basically what that means, if you're eating a burger that's been produced somewhere abroad and um, using grain that's been imported to the place where it was produced, so like some, you know, soya from perhaps, a, which might have resulted in a rainforest being chopped down somewhere else, um, and then fed to animals that are kept in sheds, purely grain fed, never see a, never see a bit of grass in their whole lives and then that's imported into this country, that burger is a really, really different beast to a burger from maybe one of your local farmers who's really trying to do the right thing by the environment and protect our climate, protect biodiversity, and which has traveled a short distance and where there's been a kind of high welfare approach. So I just want you to look at that um, in turn, and, and just to be really clear, the meat stuff and meat and dairy stuff's really important. But it's, um, but it's not as simple as just saying all meat is bad. So what does a climate friendly diet actually look like then? So obviously, if you look at the left hand side of that plate, it's mostly vegetables. Um, also in there, there's whole grains, there's some um, non meat protein, so that's things like lentils and beans. Um, and there, there is in there, if you choose to eat it, not everybody does, some meat and dairy. Um, but the point about that is it's a lot less. Um, we do need to reduce our meat and dairy, and that's really clear. Even higher welfare and um, better produced meat and dairy, we do need to eat less of, um, and it should be the better produced stuff in order to, to remain climate friendly, not the stuff that was on the far right-hand side in the slide we looked at uh, before. And also less processed food. I mean, basically, when you look at that plate, it's pretty much the same as the plate that gets thrown up when it when people try and tell you what a healthy diet looks like. So it's not such a bad thing. I've got three things for you to think about um, in terms of making decisions and making recommendations around climate change. One of them, of course, has to be land use, which a lot of others are talking about in more detail today. And clearly localised changes in the way we use land and, it, and the way we farm is hugely important in reducing the impact of climate change and much more. Um, I would just also add, though, that do remember that if, if those changes involve um, displacing food production, so, for instance, um, you know, so, well, basically, you know, things, some, a lot of um, projects involve things like planting trees, uh, just be aware that that might mean importing more food from further away. So I think we just have to be careful not to inadvertently increase carbon through one, one means by reducing it in another way. Um, but clearly, you know, th but that's not to say we shouldn't all think about land use. And there's lots of ways as well we can think about land use, um, about capturing carbon while still producing food, whether that's thinking about those trees being nut trees or just thinking about using different methods to produce our arable, um, our dairy and meat. Next thing to think about is food waste. I've already said it's a huge contributor. So there's a lot of opportunities there, not least because some, you know, it's the way we, uh, food waste is partly under local control. Um, it's a win-win, it saves money if we save waste as well, whether that's for producers or for us at home. And I would say it's also really important to think about, produ about reducing food waste, not just about getting better at recycling it. So it's not all about composting stuff that's been wasted. It's about preventing that stuff ending up in, in the bin in the first place.
Third thing to think about is procurement. And by that, we mean how you spend public money. So that's the big institutions, the councils, the hospitals, the health bodies, people who buy in food in large amounts, who do large amounts of catering. And it's really clear that using that spend well, using procurement well, can really help not only directly reduce the carbon footprint of food, but also help with those that would help to stimulate the economies, um, you know, help those local farmers, local food producers, local food distributors, and help to make that happen much better, which then has a knock on on all those areas. So that's really important. A couple of other things I was going to touch on really briefly. So one of those things is, of course, um, to include the food in your action plan. We said at the beginning, lots of people don't even touch food. So and actually, it's such an important contributor. So please remember to include the food. You might want to think about supporting your local food partnership as well as a, a, um, food partnerships are brilliant for um, looking at these whole food system issues. Uh, you might want to think about low carbon supply chains. I'm not, I don't, I'm not up to speed with what's happening in your areas, but lots of rural areas um, in particular, well, areas generally, um, particularly after COVID when there's been a bit of a spurt in things like veg boxes, but they're looking now at how they can localise some of the food supply chains and decarbonise them, whether that's food hubs or whether it's something just something as simple as improving local markets looking at electric delivery stuff, so those last mile solutions that you might be looking at under transport, techie things, apps, that kind of thing. Um, but just to say there is a lot of overlap here, of course, with transport. I don't think people always think of them as the same thing. But actually, when you're looking at how transport happens, why there's all those trucks on the road, where a lot of those deliveries are going, what those trucks contain, and also when people get in their cars, what they're going to do, their food shop is often a really important component of that. So I'd say it's important to look at those things together. I've also put in a plug for signing up to Food for the Planet, which a food partnership or a council can do, and that's a, a sustainable food places campaign, and it contains some useful kind of um, toolkit type things for taking action on climate and food. The one I've, I've particularly focused on here is this Planet Pledge, and that's around um, supporting and encouraging uh, caterers. So that can be like the big ones as well, the public ones we've already talked about, who, um, but and also restaurants, also um, in the private sector. Um, and it's about um, helping and supporting and encouraging them to uh, reduce their carbon footprint by making commitments. And obviously it's got benefits to them as well because they can advertise that and communicate what they're doing to their uh, customers or their clients. So thank you for listening. It's been brilliant to talk to you and I'm looking forward to taking part in the discussion. Okay, thank you, Emily. We're just gonna take a moment just to gather our thoughts on some of what Emily has just said to us. Okay, so we're gonna move you now for the final time into your uh, small groups with your facilitators to put your questions to, to the panel to decide what those are going to be. Just a reminder that we've got all our three panel speakers that have you just heard from them, and we will have a uh, bill from the NFU as part of that panel as well. But we'll see you in 15 minutes. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope that was useful in terms of just coming up with some questions uh, for our panel. So we are now joined by Helen Stace, Emily O'Brien, Ben Taylor Davis, and also Bill Kwan. Um, so as before, we go round to each of your group facilitators for your key question. Um, so Paul, we're, com we're coming to you first, please. Great, hi. Um... So the, the, there was a lot of content around individual behavior in terms of dietary habits. Um, and that's great, but how do we get people to do it? So how do we do develop behavior change, particularly including, you know, stuff that's going to be uh, reducing the emissions, obviously, and that includes the sourcing of those. Okay, food miles thanks. Thank you, Paul. Can we start with you on that one, Emily, please? Yeah, sure. And I know this came up in the previous um, Q&A as well. So I think the first thing to say is actually um, sort of behaviour change on diet is really not easy, is it? I mean, if, we, if, if it was easy, we wouldn't have the obesity epidemic we have at the minute, because I think most of us who would like to use 
lose a few pounds, we would really like to. It's not that we're somehow holding out in that we're not. So if it was really easy to do behaviour um, change in food, then we wouldn't have all those people who are overweight at the moment. And I'm including myself with a few lockdown pounds in that. Um, but having said that, one thing we are seeing is that um, actually meat consumption is going down quite a bit. I think it was something like 7% in the last decade. It's quite, quite a big move already. Um, and I think those kind of wider system change things that I talked about, like using public procurement, so the public spend money to try and help some of those behaviour changes is really, really important around doing that. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Emily. So, Paul, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to kind of maybe push. I don't. I don't mean to push any individual, but um, I, I'm just thinking about. I think people were talking about systemic changes, a bit like you know when we brought the five p charge in the plastic bag. There was an incentive there to not use them. Uh, what's going to increase the behaviour change? Are there any systemic ideas that have, uh, the experts have got that we could consider asking the council to to promote? Do you want me to come back on that, Sarah? Yes, please. Is that to someone yeah, else? Yeah, great. Um, Thank you. I mean, I'm happy to hand it over. I mean, just to say the 5p carrier bag charge is was a national thing wasn't it so obviously in terms of what we do locally I think it's around things like I've already suggested working with the food partnership um, and perhaps giving them support I know they're looking to set up a they've got a food alliance at the minute and they're looking to develop a food charter I don't think it's something that I can just give you an off the peg answer because actually food's quite complicated and usually involves taking action in quite a few different areas and in quite a few different ways which is why that whole food partnership model tends to work well um, so I can't give you like one single answer. There are some things that government could do, like a 5p carrier um, bag charge, but that's outside of the scope of what we can do locally. But in terms of local working, I think it's about um, collectively addressing food issues and doing what we can within what we have locally. And I particularly put in a plug for the food partnership on that. OK, thanks, Emily. Um, ben, do, do you have anything to, to add to that? Any thoughts? Um, locally, it's very hard. Um, I think when when you start looking at, at trying to pe uh, change pe people's behaviour locally, it's really hard. But for me, um, things like um, really really basic things like supermarkets have um, could have the ability to put locally grown seasonal fruit as you enter the store and the further down the, the grocery aisle you, you you move the more air miles or the more carbon um, uh, um, you, you sort of admit and it, it, it become it, things like that should become very obvious and, and the same with meat and that sort of thing you, you know how are things produced is it intensive feedlot is it is it pasture fed and that sort of thing and there should be it, it could be so simple but mm. um, unfortunately um, it is all muddied you know, there's so many labelling issues around the Union Jacket that's stamped on anything that, that's even packaged in the UK, whether it's bought in from wherever. Um, and, I, and I think some, some really basic, simple things, because I think people are starting to ask the questions, where is it produced, how is it produced, and that sort of thing. So, so I think actually supporting, supporting that question for me. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Kath, can we come to your group, please, for your question? Yeah, um, I'm going to change my question because some of that was just answered by Ben on that because our, our conversations were a lot around food. Um, but uh, this one is um, sort of aimed more at Ben, really. Um, this was about the um, soil and um, looking at the microbes content and the health of the soil. Is this something that can be regulated and monitored by an independent body that can, can support and advise other farmers to um, adopt some of this um, practice? Um. Yes and no, I guess, is the easiest, is unfortunately the obvious answer. Uh, yes, it could be regulated. The problem being, it's the set of parameters by which things get regulated are often the very things that drive people away from doing something. Um, there, 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 there is a, an incentive coming in at the moment called the SFI um, that's looking at protecting and, and enhancing soils. But there are so many parties sat around a table squabbling over what should be in and out. Unfortunately, it ends up not focusing on the, 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 the really good stuff. Um, there are too many people, um, from my point of view, that's, that, that have a massive influence on farming. 
to the point where, in actual fact, I'm, I'm one of the chapters of the book I'm writing at the moment is who owns your farm? You know, is it an agronomist? Is it a vet? Is it an advisor? Is it a land agent? Is it any, anybody like that? Because it seems, or fertilizer salesman, pesticide salesman, um, and 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 it, it becomes quite rather quite confusing. And and taking ownership back of your farm and starting to understand. You know, and actually getting people to take a spade out, out, from my point of view, and actually start understanding the soil should have a smell, and it should smell lovely, it should smell earthy, it should smell rich, and that's the microbes working. It should smell rather quite sweet when roots are actually pumping these sugars into the soil to feed microbes and that sort of thing. And anything that doesn't smell like that, you've got a, you've got a problem. Um, so, so, and I think that that's... And, and what I'm seeing as a farm advisor, as well as what I'm doing, um, is that there are so many more farmers taking ownership of improving soil health because they realise that it is that soil health that is actually going to save their business. Mm. OK, thank you, Ben. Uh, Bill, do you have anything that you wish to add to that? Yeah, I, I entirely advocate what Ben's saying. Um, I've actually got no problem with the price of food going up because we've got two used to cheap food and cheap water. Well, what happens with cheap water? You often get sewage in the rivers. What happens with you get cheap food? Standards are driven down to produce great food at all price points. So if, if, we, if we pay a, a better price for our food, the climate benefits because we actually waste less, we throw le more away. And there's a chat in the comment about whales picking up waste bins for food. Well. If we really measured what we wasted, we'd be ashamed with ourselves. Mm. And the thing about um, um, meat, I, I, I wouldn't say that it's about eating less meat. I would say it's about eating better meat. And consumption is about steady when you um, put into the equation the fact that um, the world population is going up. So we're using the same amount of meat. And when you look in our own local city, the queues outside McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, they want great meat, chicken, beef, potatoes, milk, eggs, all the things that are produced here at every price point. Mm. So whether you choose to have the top spec, organic, locally grown, extra extra uh, long life, or whether you have the 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 the, the basic product, you know, the everyday good food out of your local supermarket. They, they all count and you know we have to do it we're not going to waste nutrients we're not chucking away pesticides just for the sake of it those days are long gone okay thank you bill uh, lauren can we come to you ne next please yes so again lots of different questions but i think we'll go for how much control does Herefordshire council have on bad farming practices uh, we talked about what we as communities and individuals can do to support our farmers so that's where that question came from i don't know if that's a question for ben or bill okay uh is ben boswell still with us or natalia did you want to answer that yeah um there are some controls within policy and planning. So, um, and I suppose also the strength in partnership that I mentioned before. So there will be um, controls that we can do, but also the environment agency, working with them as well, particularly. And remember along the river lug, I think, can you remember that case which happened where um, a lot of the side of the river was stripped down? So we got very heavily involved in that and we had to find out, get to the root of what why it happened and what happened mm. okay i don't know if ben wanted to add some specifics around that yeah i, I was think... just going to say there's um oh sorry did you have time no it's like in? yeah go on ben go um yeah a lot of it's partnership working so as natalia says a lot of it's uh, environment agency regulation working closely with defra and other agencies which we work with you know a lot on on farming and, and with the river as we've mentioned before so um the council has some influence, but it, it's as a partner and as a, a, a county leader as well, really. OK, thank you. And Bill, you wanted to add to that, too. Yeah, I'd just say we're a highly regulated industry, whether it be the Environment Agency, Trading Standards, DEFRA. You know, we have to operate under a system of rules that's designated by the consumer, by our government. And they're, all those records are there to be inspected. If you, if anybody wishes to see the cross compliance book for 
any farm, they are there, which records all the nutrients, all the practices, all the slopes, you know, how they handle everything. Okay. And Thank just you. going on to rivers, there isn't enough maintenance in Herefordshire rivers, and there's an extreme worry from farmers that, you know, the rivers are not being cleaned out of the debris that comes down them. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Helen, you wanted to contribute to that. Yes, yes, I, I, I don't think I agree entirely with that because some of the debris that comes down the river forms um, nice little dams that are really good for wildlife. But uh, I think there is a real problem in the rivers. And one of the issues there is that the Environment Agency and the statutory agencies generally have been um, hugely cut back in all of the government reductions and they haven't been doing the enforcement and the, the checking and the monitoring of rivers that they should have been. So there's a, a huge issue on the River Wye and the River Lug that we've been trying to influence. Yeah, okay, thank you, Helen. I'm just conscious of time, so we'll move to Vicky uh, for the question from your group, please. Yes. Um... I'm going to ask Helen a question because she hasn't had many, so we'll have a bit of nature for a bit, since we have covered some of our other areas. Um, why um, our group, my group wanted to know that why don't we have easy wins in Herefordshire, like suitable verges, roundabouts, and other uh, maybe other places planted with wildflowers, so we increase our coverage in that way in public areas. Okay, well, we do have some of those. So uh, Herefordshire Wildlife Trust supports an organisation called Verging on Wild, and they've been looking after a number of the, the road verges that are particularly rich in flowers. So we have been um, doing that and talking with the council of Alpha Beach about how road verges are, are managed. So, so there is some of that going on. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And Mary, would you like to put your question forward, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is for Ben. Um, why did you adopt regenerative farming? Was it an outside influence? Was it ethical for, or financial? And if it's so beneficial, why do more farmers not do it? Wow, great question. Um, why, why? Funny enough, I'm just I'm just on my way to America actually to to talk exactly about why, how, and 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 everything about regenerative farming from my point of view. So ours, ours was very much uh, in the in the first and foremost um, financial. Um, I was seeing far more going out than coming in, which is why I talk so much about farm ownership. You know, every single every single bill that seems to be getting larger and larger, yields never seem to be going up and up and up. They, they, um, and I was very fortunate to do a, a, a world study tour called a Nuffield back in 2015, 2016 where I, where I um, was so lucky to, to visit so many places that were basically changed the whole way they farmed uh, in, in so much as when, when you start considering that soil and soil is a, is a living organism and when, when you actually protect it, enhance it and do what you need to do to it, it actually gives back so much more. And, and everything else we were doing was what we call a moron approach and that we put more and more on and getting absolutely nowhere and, and, and generally going backwards. So, so financial was the first was the first thing. Then um, I, I, I had um, an awful lot of mental health problems at the time as well, and they they've been uh, very much. Um, I don't think you could ever be cured of mental health problems, but what I'd like to say is I'm having so much more fun, so much less pressure, so much more enjoyment by seeing brown hairs back on the farm, yellow hammers, um, lapwings, and all those sort of things that. The, the, the indicator species that I was always told about, about that was, that's good for people and, and people's mental health and social health, uh, they really do give you that. And, and when you see, you, you know, um, a flood of animals grazing um, cover crops in a way that actually is building soil rather than taking soil or making it more erodible, it's, uh, it just gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, so, so for me, it, it, it started financially. It then became something as a as a mental health drive, and then you realise um, why it's um, why why it's so beneficial for everything. And when you ask why aren't more people um, embracing, I I set up a business um, giving advice on regenerative agriculture, and and, and what I, what I'm trying to do is do a two or three year uh, advisory session with a farmer, set him free pretty much then, and let let them go. I wish I could clone myself <laughs> ten times over the demand from farms in the UK is absolutely incredible. Daily emails 
from people wanting to change and wanting to get off this this moral approach. So there is there is an absolute desire to 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 make a difference, whether that's financial, whether that's whether that's for an environment, whether that's for their own uh, own business, what whatever. There, there, there are so many different stories out there, but it is incredible the amount of people that now want to get into regenerative farming. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, so we've got a few minutes left of this Q and A session. Um, so I wanted to open up uh, questions to all of you, but Brian, I just wanted to come back to you, if that's okay, just to check whether you felt whether your question was addressed in the last uh, Q and A panel, um, or whether there was anything further you wanted to say about it. Um, so this is the question about the uh, carbon char. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, through private message, I've actually uh, emailed Ben Bodswell with some of the details and, and offered to put him in contact with the uh, researcher that's undertaking the research. Okay. Um, so in, in that respect, yes. But I would actually like to know, on a side, why is our closest farmers market 22 miles away in Abergavenny? Um, yeah, just to come in on that, um, obviously I'm not uh, local, I've, but um, in terms of what other areas have done, again, looking at, I think I mentioned in my presentation that one of the things that is more within local powers and perhaps local council powers is to support some of those local markets, whether that's actually a physical kind of farmer's market or whether it's um, like a virtual market, you know, kind of online ordering and stuff. And that is something that some areas are looking to put a bit of energy into is supporting um, some of those local supplies, which then in, can help kind of build your local food economy and support some of those farmers who are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And again, um, food partnerships can play a really important role, I think, in bringing some of those together, because it's not a simple thing, is it? You've got to have pe um, mm -hmm. players from all ends. Thanks, Emily. Natalia, did you want to respond to that? Just yeah, on. just briefly, well, I mean, people were, you know, Around the virtual table will know that we did have one for a number of years and then seemed to have petered out um it might have been the effects of covid um it could have been the sort of commitment people have to make while they're farming they have to sell as well so mm -hmm. there was definitely one um that i used to visit in town but that seems to have um, gone by the wayside we don't seem to have one so regularly they do have stalls in town um and i think kington Kington does have a regular farmer's market. Mm, Maybe it is because mm. COVID is, has yeah. just put a stop to it at the moment. Okay, thanks, Natalia. Uh, John, should we just quickly go to you for your question? Well, on this business of reforesting the banks of the rivers and reintroducing wildlife, I struggle to, to understand why we just don't get on with it and what's stopping us getting on with it, I'd like to know. Okay. Um, and we could do with some visible successes in this environmental area where people get excited and it's something a story that could be told to the community by the council or whatever so what is stopping us okay getting it's, on with that? i'd Go like in. to answer that yes I, I i it's very simply it's money um the agricultural land is fetching quite high prices now so it's very difficult for organizations such as the wildlife trust to actually acquire areas of land to to, to restore um, a lot of the floodplain uh, in the River Wye used to be floodplain meadow, and it all got ploughed up in about the 90s and early, early 2000s. And um, it's really, really difficult to persuade farmers to do anything different because there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment about how farming subsidies are going to change and what incentives are going to be available. Um, we would love to be able to uh, restore a lot of the floodplain and create a better river corridor uh, and encourage the regenerative farmers and end up with a floodplain that would support a healthy river and also min minimise the flooding, um, help reduce flooding in Hereford and the other places. Yeah. OK, no, thank no, you, no. Helen. I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to leave it there. Sorry, um, okay. just because we want to make sure that you finish on time. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now, who's going to introduce the next the next session. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you. OK, so we are literally, you know, we're this close to finishing. So but we've got to really maintain our energy for this last session. And it's really hard this time of day. We're flagging. We're feeling a bit tired we've got our eye on the clock okay but you are on the home straight you've done absolutely brilliantly so far so i'm just going to get to we're going to do what we did yesterday a few kind of like 
stretching exercises that try and breathe a bit of energy back into ourselves. John's already going. I love it. So let's reach out, like stretch up. If you can stand up even better, just really kind of stretch up to the sky. Okay, let's bring our eyes down, maybe do a few shoulder, shoulder rotations, release some of that tension from our bodies from sitting down for so long. Uh, Max had a good one there. We're just going to bring our, our arms over our bodies and just gently kind of stretch out those shoulders. That's great. Again, if you can stand, that's even better. Give a little kind of shake your body out, kind of just keep that energy going. Okay, because we literally, we're sort of, we're 20 minutes off of finishing. Okay, and it's really important now that you have those final discussions with your facilitators. Again, you could probably tell me what we're about to do because you've already done it a few times. So we're going to go into their small group sessions, looking at where you think we should focus our attention when we're thinking about reducing emissions from food, farming and land use. Okay, we're going to see you back here in, to be precise, 17 minutes. We'll see you back then. Have great discussions. Keep your energy high. Okay, welcome back for the final time this weekend. So um, I just want to say uh, two things really, just and then I'll just wrap up with a few um, kind of admin related things uh, before I let you get all off. Um, just a massive thank you really to all our speakers that have been with us Thursday and this weekend. I think we've had some fantastic presentations, um, all of which will be on Basecamp. So by Monday, all those presentations should be on Basecamp um, and we'll make sure that we get hold of slides as well. I know lots of you have said that the slides themselves will be really useful to you. Um, but a, a really, really huge thank you to all of you. Um, I think it's been an a intense weekend. Um, it's been a tiring weekend, but thank you so much for all your levels of engagement, which I think has been fantastic. Uh, all the discussions you've had and the quality of those. Uh, thanks for adhering to the conversation guidelines along the way. Um, I think hopefully it's been a really positive experience for you so far. Um, we will be sending around a short survey, and I think it's five or six questions just after this um, session um, closes, just to get some of your feedback on your experience to date, to get some feedback on the facilitators, uh, whether there's anything any, anybody could be doing any differently. But also, it's another opportunity for you to let us know whether there are any of those gaps that we kind of would kind of look to plug um, over the, the forthcoming sessions. Um, we can't promise we're going to be able to plug everything. Obviously, we'll look at where there are kind of main themes around what, what we might be able to, to plug. Just to say, in terms of the next coming session, so our next session is Thursday the 27th, 7 till 9. Um, and then obviously, we've got the weekend uh, following that. Um, and really now a lot in terms of content and input, you've had most of it. And um, we're gonna obviously plug some of those gaps for you where we can, but really the focus particularly of the, that next weekend we're gonna spend with you, it's going to be a lot about discussion, debate, deliberation, and us sharing the process through which you're going to ultimately come up with your recommendations uh, for the council and other partners that they'll be working with. So we'll give you more information and a more detailed programme on that, obviously ahead of that time. Um, so just to say, just to remind you, the links for all of those sessions will be coming out on the morning of the sessions themselves. So um, I think that's probably everything from us. Uh, just to reiterate, thank you so much for giving up your weekend and spending it uh, with us. We hope you feel that's been a valuable use of your time. Um, and we just really look forward to seeing you um, on the 27th and then the following weekend. So have a great weekend. Uh, hope we haven't left you feeling uh, too tired and too deflated. Um, but again, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you soon.